Much like the servants in today's episode, I just wanted to comment on how expertly Brienne filled up <laughs> this chocolate milkshake to the brim of this cup. Was that intentional, or were you just, uh... We'll say it was intentional. Yeah, okay. Because it makes it sound good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you did a very good job. Uh, and I know that you're probably not here uh, for my milkshake tips, but in case you happen to be interested in watching The Chosen, but also making milkshakes, I just wanted to quickly provide you with the best milkshake recipe ever. you got to take some Promised Land chocolate milk, mm -hmm. and you need to take some homemade vanilla bluebell ice cream, mix those bad boys together, mwah! Welcome to Now Let's Be Honest About Movies. My name is David Tate. And my name is Brienne. And we basically have just been lately, uh, me and Brienne, or me and some other friends, we've just been walking through the TV show The Chosen, and we've just been talking about, you know, breaking down the episode scene by scene, episode by episode throughout the whole show, mm -hmm. and we're just talking about it from a historical, biblical, theological, cultural, all those different viewpoints, mm -hmm. to just talk about what's in the Bible, what's not in the Bible, what's historical, what's not historical, where are they taking liberties and stuff like that, and this, these aren't videos intended for everybody. But for the people who watch The Chosen and they want to go a little bit deeper and they want to actually learn a little bit more about the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these videos are typically a lot longer. So we're hunkered down here. Yeah. We were just before we clicked record, uh, we were talking about we're going to be here for a while. That's why we got a milkshake. Uh, yeah, that's why we got a milkshake. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is going to be a pretty long video. We are on The Chosen episode five. As you can see, if you've been here before, Brienne, she has a haircut now. Uh, her hair's a little I bit do. shorter in case you were wanting an update. <laughs> and you'll also see that we have these cool shirts on, Binge Jesus, and on yeah. the back says the chosen, chosen. kind of cool and that was actually we want to just give our thanks mm -hmm. to the people at the chosen because they actually messaged us on instagram and we're like hey uh we like your videos we would love to send you some free merchandise yeah. and we got these in the mail yesterday so uh Sweet. you're not going to see this video for a while but we got these in the mail and we're going to wear them now going forward so yeah. thank you to the chosen people the powers that be for sending us these because yeah. we appreciate them yes they're really soft you should yes. buy one yes you they're, should they're great quality. no they're actually really soft yeah they uh, really are no this is, this is nice. I like it. I, I like these quality shirts. Uh, but that being said, we have reached the chosen episode five, and this episode is titled The Wedding Gift. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the chosen episode five? I really liked it. I feel like they keep getting better and better each It's a good episode. milkshake. Is it good? Yeah, it's a good milkshake. Sorry. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Continue. Point for Continue. Brian. Yes. Each time we watch an episode, it gets better and better each time. So I feel like every time we rank them, like, oh yeah, this one's three stars. This one's four stars. This one's five stars. It just like keep going, keeps going up. They definitely didn't disappoint. I liked it a lot. Yeah, this is another one of those episodes. Basically, I, I was warning y'all about this in each of these videos. The first three episodes of The Chosen are mainly just like the foundation. You know, it's just like yeah. laying the groundwork and the cultural stuff mm -hmm. and the historical stuff so that once you hit episode four and onwards... The show just gets rolling, and now it's biblical stuff pretty much every single episode mm -hmm. going forward, and you're getting multiple Bible stuff like yeah. in every single episode. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the case with episode five. Yes. Because this whole episode, basically, you know, the central thing, it's called The Wedding Gift. This episode revolves around the wedding at Cana, yeah. which, if you're familiar with the Gospels, it takes place in John chapter 2. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, and it is Jesus' very first public miracle, or yeah. as John would call them, his public signs mm -hmm. right uh, because mm -hmm. every sign points to who jesus is mm -hmm. you know so um that's the whole crux of this episode that's what we're building to uh and i would agree it's a pretty good episode mm -hmm. i do have some opinions later on when it comes to how they actually pulled off the miracle but overall i would still agree with you that these episodes are getting better and better and that the chosen still continues to be without a doubt my favorite Bible to TV show or Bible to any other media adaptation. Yeah. I really like what they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. And that being said, got a lot of opinions. And so let's just, let's talk about it. Yeah. Let's just walk through the episode like we normally do. The episode opens up and we are in Jerusalem in AD 12. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to see is we're going to see um, a story from another chapter two of the gospels, but this is Luke chapter two, and this is going to be playing out. And this is Jesus at the age of 12 where he has basically been forgotten by his family mm -hmm. in Jerusalem after the Passover, and then his parents, they come back, they're looking for him everywhere, and they finally find him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do have this from Scripture. I'll read the passage in a little bit. 
But one thing I did want to comment on, and if you've been in past videos, you'll know this about me. I'm a big chronology person, mm -hmm. right? So I've been making a big, I've been making a big fuss about all the dates that they're mentioning in all these episodes. And we talked about how in episode one, basically, if you get it on DVD versus you watch it on YouTube, they have different dates. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll say AD 27 versus AD 30 whenever it comes to like when the events of the show are taking place. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like originally they had AD 30. Which would mean that Jesus started preaching in AD 30 and then went on to like AD 33 and he died. Mm -hmm. But then it seems like later on they went back and they changed it back to AD 27. So three years earlier, which would have Jesus dying at AD 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you're just wanting like a rough chronology of his life, that would mean that Jesus was probably born around 5 or 6 BC. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, this is just a quick note that I had about this because the Bible does tell us in this passage that Jesus was around 12 years old when this story takes place. Right. And so that is what kind of confused me, because this says it takes place in A.D. 12. Mm -hmm. And in the previous episodes, they established that they were going back a little bit earlier to where Jesus was born like 5 or 6 B.C., mm -hmm. which would imply that he would actually be 16 or 17, really, mm -hmm. at this point in the story, given the chronology they've established. Right. And I, I'm assuming the reason they did this, they did A.D. 12, is just because... For most people watching this, they're just going to be like, you know, they think B.C. is before Christ, A.D. is after, you know, so mm -hmm. they're just going to be like, okay, A.D. 12, Jesus is 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's why they did that. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to consistency, they keep kind of going back and forth on the dates here. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to see after this, whenever it goes to the present day, it, mm -hmm. it's A.D. 30 again. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like either there was a three-year time jump between the last episode and this episode, or they just haven't adjusted all that. So right. I'm not sure, and I'd probably have to go look it up. Uh, we watched this episode on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, the YouTube ones have been the ones that say AD 27. Right. So I don't really know what's going on with the chronology, but those are something. Those are things that I just want to point out because mm -hmm. I find that intriguing. All right, so <laughs> we open up. We're in Jerusalem in AD 12, and we see a woman who is looking around frantically for her son. Mm -hmm. She's calling out the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, you realize this is Mary, Mary. Right? And so Mary's running around. She's looking for Jesus. And through this stuff, she's talking to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And you learn very quickly that the Passover feast ended three days ago. And she's telling people, we left him here at Passover. And they're like, that was three days ago. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, and really, what happened here is, as we'll see in scripture, is that Mary and Joseph, they left from the Passover feast. And then they got away from it. And they realized Jesus isn't with us. And so they had to go back. So they went a day away. Mm -hmm. And then they had a day journey back, mm -hmm. and then they had a day of searching, right? So three days have passed since then. And the reason why is because, just culturally speaking, um, the men and women wouldn't necessarily travel together in the caravans, right? Mm -hmm. The men would travel in one place, the women would travel in another place. Yeah. Families would all be traveling together. Mm -hmm. And so you're going from Jerusalem to Galilee. you got the men in one place, women in another place, and Jesus, he's 12 years old, right? right? Typically, the children would travel with the women. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, being 12 years old, he's on the brink of manhood, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in Jewish culture, you become a man at 13, mm -hmm. right? So most likely they would go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so Mary probably thought Jesus was with Joseph. Joseph probably but thought Jesus was with Mary. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're wandering around. They're like, you don't have him? <laughs> yeah. And, and just imagine the fright of that. Oh, yeah. Like literally these people realize that God entrusted, like this is the Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what? Do you, how are you going to pray to God? Be like, hey, God, you know that only begotten son that you gave us? We lost him. <laughs> I don't know where he's at. <laughs> it's, it's actually a pretty funny story when you read it in scripture just because you're like, wow, I can totally see why they're freaking out here. Yeah. Uh, but we, we see this story playing out. And then uh, finally, uh, Joseph comes around and he's with Jesus and he explains that um, Jesus was found in the temple. Mm -hmm. Jesus, though, he kind of frames it a different way. He says he was with his father. Right. Yes. Right. And it's like, whoa. And then that's whenever they like pan up and you get to see like the temple in the background. Uh -huh. And this is the first time you've seen the temple mm -hmm. uh, in the chosen series because so far we've been in Galilee for all of this. But now we're in Jerusalem and we see the temple and we're going to see that a lot more in season two when that comes out soon. Uh, but Joseph says that Jesus was teaching then the rabbis, they couldn't believe their ears, right? So he's like, Mary, you wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. When I found him, he wasn't just like wandering around aimlessly. He was literally sitting there teaching the rabbis. They almost wouldn't let him leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus says that he was in his father's house. Yeah. Right? He's like, hey, where did you expect me to be? Mm -hmm. I was just in my father's house chilling. Right? And, and all this is like blowing their minds. You know, yeah. like Joseph actually seems like kind of fine with it, but I think it's probably because him and Jesus have talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. They come back to find Mary. Um, and then this is whenever Mary, she says something that will be called back to 
mm-hmm. later on. Mm-hmm. She says, it's too early for all of this, mm-hmm. right? Because Jesus is saying all these like very theologically profound things. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says to her, if not now, when? Mm-hmm. Right? And then she just says, just help us get through all of this with you. And then this is whenever she like pulls him and like the camera does this thing where it just like focuses in on yeah. her face. And she just says, please. Mm-hmm. Right? And then she says, he's, uh, Jesus says, okay. And then Joseph asked Jesus not to do that again. And Jesus says, yes, Abba. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to the opening credits. I like whenever they incorporate things that are... I guess, well, I mean, that is in scripture, but we see Jesus a lot, like, during his ministry, not as, like, a child, Mm -hmm. and I think it's easy to forget that, like, he was born a baby, and he had to grow up all the way until he was 30 to then start his ministry. Like, he only had three years of his ministry, Mm -hmm. and so all that other time, like, he was just a kid. Even there was another line when he was like, oh, yeah, like, I was playing with my family, and I, like, busted my head open. It's like, oh, my gosh, he was a kid, and he did things like what we did when we were kids. So I think it was like good that mm-hmm. they incorporated that. We literally only have a few accounts of Jesus' childhood in Scripture. One of them is whenever the wise men come and visit him, which is probably a little bit after he was born, so he's probably a young kid at this right. point. And then the only other story we get is this story right here in Luke mm-hmm. chapter 2 when he's 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And then it just jumps to him being 30 years old. So really a great majority of Jesus' life, We don't have accounted for. And there's been some scholars who have even gotten together and they think that really the Gospels, whenever you look at them, only really account for about 54 or so days of Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. Over like three and a half years, but really it's only like 54 days. So Mm -hmm. less than two months worth Mm -hmm. out of a three and a half year ministry, out of like a 33 and a half year life. Right. So really, we don't know that much about Jesus' life. We just know about the essential things. Mm -hmm. And so I do like that they include little details like that to kind of remind you, hey, this guy just didn't pop up here. He literally grew up as a kid, and we're going to see, you know, he, he bruised himself, and he injured himself, yeah. and he had to go through all the different things like this. He got corrected by his parents. He didn't do anything wrong, but they still had to correct him, right? Because the thing is, they're not perfect, you know? And, and even whenever Joseph gets on to him, he says, don't do this again. Jesus says, yes, Abba. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't in the wrong there, but he just says, okay, yes, sir. The passage that this is coming from is Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41, and it says this. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Right. And so that's the whole story. And I like that they included that here because it it presents a nice little backdrop that sets up the relationship between Jesus and his mother Mm -hmm. going into the wedding at Cana. Yeah. Uh, Because really, we don't have a whole lot mentioned about Mary either uh, in the Gospels. We literally have the whole virgin birth thing where she gives birth to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have the thing with the Magi. We have a little bit more about her in the Gospel of Luke because it seems like maybe Mary was one of the people that Luke interviewed when it Mm -hmm. came to acquire, like collecting his stuff for his Gospels. Even like that's why in that passage you have it saying his mother stored all these things in her heart. Other than that, we have her mentioned a few times In the Gospel of John, but I don't think her name is even ever given. It just says the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so there's the wedding in Cana. We have her at the cross of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, But other than that, in the Gospel, it's not really mentioned a whole lot. There's one scene where her and Jesus' siblings come to find him, uh, but Jesus kind of rejects them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I do like that they took this story and they used that as a way to set up the dynamic between Jesus and Mary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then the opening credits roll. And now we are in Cana in A.D. 30. Right, so once again, chronology, I don't know what's going on there, but we're back back to being in AD 30 here, so it's kind of just jumping all around. Uh, part of me just wishes they would just choose one and just roll with it, rather yeah. than jumping back and forth. And we meet this woman named Dinah, and she looks very giddy as she's walking around, mm-hmm. and this is when Mary shows up and offers her help. Apparently, 
Dinah is the mother of the groom for the big wedding that's going to be the backdrop of this entire episode. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Mary and Dinah were, I guess, childhood friends from back in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, And so we get that quick scene just setting everything up. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to the scene between Nicodemus and John the Baptist. Yes. Right? Because this is where episode four ended. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't know if I explained this to you, but the way that they did this is they basically released half the season... Mm-hmm. Um, they released the first four episodes, and then later on they released the second four. Oh. So in a way, the first four episodes were like their own mini-season. Yeah. And so that episode ended with Nicodemus coming up to John the Baptist, and it was like this massive cliffhanger. You know, mm-hmm. he comes up and he's like, I'm here to talk about miracles, and John the Baptist walks up and he's like, what? And mm-hmm. then it just ends. And so I remember I was waiting for episodes five through eight, because I was like, ah, this is exciting. Yeah. And so here's where we get the fulfillment of that, right? Mm-hmm. We get the, uh, the, closer, the closure. So John the Baptist and Nicodemus are talking. And Nicodemus thinks that John the Baptist has been the one performing the miracles, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's all stuff that was set up in episode four, right? And so he's saying, hey, I thought you were the one performing the miracles. And John the Baptist asks if that is another thing to add to his infractions, right? He's like, oh, wow, would be performing miracles another thing that you can add to my infractions? Mm -hmm. Uh, And he says that they would label Moses a lunatic for talking to a shrub. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's because whenever you look throughout Jewish history... They were not very kind to the prophets. The prophets would do a lot of really cool stuff, but the people of their day never appreciated them. It was only later on, whenever they looked back, they were like, oh, hmm, that person's stuff came true. <laughs> Guess we shouldn't have killed them. Guess they were right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so John the Baptist is just giving some little social commentary, giving some jabs at Nicodemus, and we're getting to get a feel for John the Baptist's character. Yeah. We see that he is a person who does not mind talking rudely to anybody mm-hmm. you know the, the teacher of teachers from jerusalem just came in john the baptist does not care he could easily just be like nah man that's not me yeah. but instead he feels the need to you know critique he's like oh what if i was <laughs> what to <laughs> what do you uh, so nicodemus uh he asked if john considers himself like moses because you know he compares himself to moses he's like oh well if moses was talking to a shrub he's referring to the burning bush and so right. right yes so nicodemus says do you consider yourself like moses and i like here that john doesn't answer Mm-hmm. And to me, uh, I don't know about you here, but this reminded me of John chapter 1. Uh, when we talk mm-hmm. about the Gospel of John, we're obviously not talking about John the Baptist. We're talking about the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John. Yes. Uh, and whenever you hear about a person named John in the Gospel of John, it's not talking about the Apostle John the author. It's talking about John the Baptist. Yeah. Very confusing stuff. <laughs> but in John chapter 1, some people come up to John the Baptist mm-hmm. and they're asking him different questions. They say, are you the Christ? Yes. And he says, no. And they say, are you the prophet? He says, no. Mm -hmm. They say, are you Elijah? He says, no. Mm -hmm. But the key thing there is the the term the prophet, Mm -hmm. right? Because this goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses, basically, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, he is giving his basically closing message to the people of Israel and commanding them to be faithful to God and stuff. And he says in Deuteronomy 18 that a prophet like him will come. And when that person comes, you should listen to him because he will lead you to God. Mm -hmm. So there was this prevalent idea at the time where they were awaiting this prophet. And some people, they didn't know if the prophet was going to be this Elijah figure that's also promised in the Old Testament, or if he would be the Messiah that's promised in the Old Testament, or if he'd be this totally separate person. But it seems like that's what Nicodemus is hinting at here. He's like, oh, okay, so you're associating yourself with prophets, Mm -hmm. and you're comparing yourself to Moses. Do you think you're like Moses? Mm -hmm. And so I like here that John the Baptist just doesn't answer, because he easily could. He could be like, nah. Yeah. Or he could say, yeah, but instead he's like, I'm not giving you that answer. Uh-huh. Like John the Baptist, he's just in charge of all this conversation. <laughs> At this point, this is where Nicodemus, he kind of sits down and takes off his headdress. Yeah. And he asks John about his ministry. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what you thought about this, but to me, when I was watching this, it seemed like this was tr- Nicodemus trying to kind of like cool the tension a little bit. Yes. And he's yes. like, okay, I know that I came in here guns blazing, like just kind of like with these accusations. I'm yeah. going to lower myself down, take like, let's, yeah, let's be a little less have formal. a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Because you could tell that John the Baptist was being very antagonistic mm-hmm. as in like he was like kind of lumping Nicodemus with all the other Pharisees. Right. Yeah. And Nicodemus is like, hey, I get that. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's come at this from a different angle because mm-hmm. I want you to know like. I'm, I seriously want to know about you. With good intentions, yeah. Yeah. And so he sits down and he's like, John, tell me about your ministry. Mm-hmm. And so this is where John recounts how Caesar had people clear out the roads for his arrival. Mm-hmm. Right? He says, you remember when Caesar was coming in he had everybody like clear out the logs and stuff for the streets? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Nicodemus asked John the Baptist if they are supposed to be clearing the way for him. Mm-hmm. Uh and basically the idea like, oh, do you view yourself as a king? Do you view yourself as Caesar? Mm-hmm. But really what John is alluding to mm-hmm. here is if you read any of the synoptic gospels, it might be in the gospel of John as well, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that they'll introduce the character of John the Baptist is with this quote from Isaiah chapter 40, which says this. 
A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Basically, this is a prophecy about this person, this herald, who would show up much like the people who would prepare the way for Caesar, right? And they would say, hey, everybody, clear out the roads because the king is about to show up. And so you want to make sure everything's pristine and ready for him. This is how John the Baptist responds when Nicodemus asks about his ministry. He says, yes. well, I'm much like the person who's clearing the way for the king. Mm-hmm. right? I'm the one who's making sure everything is nice and pristine so that when the king shows up, mm-hmm. everything's good. And that was John the Baptist's purpose, right? He showed up right. to call people to repentance so that whenever the Messiah shows up, they're ready to follow him. But Nicodemus doesn't understand that. He th- he immediately jumps to the conclusion that John the Baptist thinks himself to be the Messiah right. and everybody else is supposed to pave the way for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not what John the Baptist is getting at here. Mm-hmm. And this is whenever John, he starts kind of criticizing Nicodemus again. He's like, I don't like your groups. The cost of the vestments alone could feed children from Nazareth for a month. Mm-hmm. He's like, he really just... He can't help but criticize. Yeah. In many ways, sometimes, I fear that I am more like John the Baptist <laughs> than I am like Jesus. Even though, to be fair, when you read the Gospels, Jesus does criticize a whole lot more than we give him credit for. Mm-hmm. Uh, but John the Baptist is definitely a lot more boisterous and just like, yeah! <laughs> uh, yeah. But he, he just, he can't help but just criticize Nicodemus a little bit. And so he's like, you know, all the money that y'all take in and y'all steal from everybody, it could feed children in Nazareth for a month. And mm-hmm. Nicodemus says, oh, are you from Nazareth? Mm-hmm. And John says, Yeah. And also from Capernaum, and Tyre, yeah. and Sidon, and Jerusalem, and Judea, and all the, and Hebron. And, and he just keeps going in all these places. Nicodemus is like, oh, one of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Nicodemus tells John, well, I hope you completed your mission, because it seems like you've got a new home now, uh, and you're in prison. Yeah. Uh, and this ultimately leads them to start talking about miracles again. Mm-hmm. And Nicodemus says, you know, John, I don't think you're a madman. I just think you're extremely stubborn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's like because like everything John's saying he's like I can tell that you are sane enough to hold a good conversation and you definitely have an idea of what you're doing you're just so stubborn you won't listen to anybody mm-hmm. uh, and so Nicodemus is kind of arriving at these conclusions and then John says why are you really here old man mm-hmm. <laughs> and Nicodemus at first he acts like he's here on official business he says well you're a Jew and if you've been falsely put in here for bad reasons, that would be a terrible precedent for Rome to adjudicate. You know, we don't want to establish this to where, you know, Rome is just in charge of doing all this stuff to the Jews. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of good um, groundwork stuff in this episode where, like, they plant seeds for something that'll pay off a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So he tries to act like he's come to John the Baptist on official business. He's like, well, you know, I'm the teacher of teacher from Jerusalem, and I just want to make sure that the Romans aren't overstepping their boundaries. Then John says, no, what's the real reason? And this is where he kind of breaks Nicodemus down. And Nicodemus says, I am searching for an explanation for something I cannot unsee. Mm -hmm. And this is going to set up the groundwork for the later conversation they're going to have. Uh, And so John asks to hear the story from the beginning. And we cut to a new scene. I really like Nicodemus' character. So anytime that he's in a scene, I really enjoy that because I really just like his character Mm -hmm. a lot. Um, And I thought it was cool that it was kind of just a simple scene. Like, we just got to see the conversation between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it was good. Good talk! (laughs) All right, cool. We got to probably, which is, this might actually be one of my favorite scenes in Mm -hmm. the whole episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is with Eden stomping on grapes, right? So Um, Eden is Simon's wife. mm -hmm. uh, And in the last episode, they did not part on good terms, Right. right? They were having a little bit of frustrations, and Eden kind of just unloaded her anger on Simon. I thought it was fairly placed, and uh, ultimately she was just calling him back to God. Mm-hmm. But there was some tension there. Right. And so Simon walks in. He's a little bit nervous. Mm-hmm. But he, sa- he says, Eden, we need to talk. And she says, so I hear. Mm-hmm. And he says, what have you heard? And she says, nothing that makes sense. Last night you told me the truth. Let's continue with that, mm-hmm. right? So, and that's because in the last episode, they'd have this conversation where it, it kind of came to, you know, a shouting match a little bit. And she did thank him. She said, hey, I don't agree with what you've been doing, but thank you for at least telling me the truth. Mm-hmm. Now go do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. So she calls back and she says, hey, last time you told me the truth, let's pick up there. Mm-hmm. And so Simon basically recounts all the events from the previous day yes. uh, and the previous night, mm-hmm. right? So he says... Eden, where do I even start? You know, I, I went and I, I was fishing all night. I tried so hard. I couldn't catch anything. And thank you for sending Andrew and James and John and Zebedee. Thank you. They were so much help. But mm-hmm. we still didn't catch anything. But then there was this teacher and he was teaching by the sea. And he came and he told me to cast my nets. And there was something about how he looked at me. And I just, 
I didn't want to, but I did it. And then there were so many fish, and now we could pay off our debts, and I don't know. Like, I don't get any of it. And he's just, he's very visibly excited by all of this. Yeah. Uh, and then to all of this, she says, why don't you seem happy? And this is where he recounts the story of the prophet Elijah calling the prophet Elisha, or Elisha, if you want to find a better way to sometimes Elijah and Elisha sound too similar and it's kind of hard yeah. uh, but he recounts this story uh, which you read in first Kings chapter 19 which says this so he Elijah departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him and he was with the 12th Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you and he said to him Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. And so Simon recounts this story to his wife and says, you know that story with Elijah and Elisha? It's exactly basically what this guy's done to me. Mm -hmm. This teacher came and he's called me to follow him. Yeah. And he's told me to follow him immediately. Mm hmm he says that this teacher is the Messiah, the Lamb who John the Baptist told Andrew about. And he says he called me to follow him and Andrew and James and John and to learn from him. And he said I wouldn't be a fisherman anymore, but that I'd catch people instead. I don't even know what that means, but I know what I saw. Mm -hmm. And you can just see, I, I like seeing how Simon goes from like very quiet to very excited yes. to very quiet again. Mm -hmm. Because this is, to me, I, I talk about this every video we do. It's very consistent with the characters that we read about in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, he, like... If you know anything about the character of Simon Peter, yeah. he's a guy who goes from zero to ten to zero real quick. Or really, I don't even know if he ever has a zero. He goes from ten to negative ten. Yeah. To ten. Like Opposite he, sides it, of yes. the spectrum. He, yeah. just go, he goes from like super positive to super negative to super positive from one extreme to the other. Yes. And we're getting all the groundwork of that here. Because this is really the first time we've seen Simon hopeful the entire show so far. Because the first four episodes, he was really just in a really tough situation constantly, not yeah. having a good time. Mm -hmm. But here, we get to see the other extreme. And he's like, I don't even know what it means, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know what's going on, but I'm so excited to do it. Uh -huh. But he still has some reserves. Mm -hmm. All right. And she turns around here, and he says, oh. he's like, I know, I, I knew you would be mad about this, right? Mm -hmm. He's really nervous. He says, I knew you'd be upset. But she calls him in for a hug. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm not upset. Mm -hmm. And she says, this is the man that I married. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you don't think I'm making it up? And she says, you couldn't make this up. Yeah. Which I thought that was funny. Uh, and then she says, of course he chose you. Uh, and he says, I don't know why he did. I told him I'm a sinful man. And she says, everyone's sinful. Mm -hmm. Right? Which, once again, good commentary. Right. She sees the potential in Simon. She's like, yeah, of course you're sinful. Mm -hmm. Look at our last conversation. Mm -hmm. I had to get on to you about it. Mm -hmm. But, of course he chose you. You know, everybody's sinful. He saw the potential that I see in you. That's why I married you. And he explains to her, I don't know how I'm going to provide. Because he was already having a tough enough time providing before. Mm -hmm. Now he's like going to be traveling and stuff. He's like, I don't know how I'm going to provide. And she says that she's not worried. She says, I'm just glad that someone finally sees in you what I have always seen. Mm -hmm. You are more than a fisherman. Yeah. It's like, aw. That's so, so sweet. sweet. Yeah. yeah. It's like, aw. <laughs> really, this whole scene is actually a very long scene. It, it, it drags on for yeah. a good bit. Uh, but it, it's like this literally just like. You can see the romance that they've developed over the past four episodes. It's like kind of culminating here. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. And so he explains to her that he'll have to travel sometimes, but he doesn't want her to feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. Right. And she says she won't feel abandoned. She feels saved. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have the same thing addressed like later on in a few episodes where Jesus is actually going to talk with Eden. And I think that seemed really cool. But he says it won't be easy. And this is where she says, when have we ever had anything easy? It's not our people's way. Mm -hmm. Eden is looking at things how an optimistic Jew would look at it. Yeah. Rather than blaming God, she realizes, eh, <laughs> we're the people who always get ourselves into trouble. Right. We don't like things easy, so uh -huh. that's fine. So after this is whenever she asks him to come help with the grapes, and so he mm -hmm. cleans off his feet, and basically he gets in there and starts treading the grapes with her. Right. Um, and he informs her, hey, we're leading to Cana later today for a wedding. She says, what does a wedding have to do with the liberation of Israel? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I think that our wedding was a little bit liberating, eh? Uh -huh. And then they start kind of talking back and forth, just like teasing each other. He acts yeah. like he's forgotten details about their wedding. He really uh -huh. hasn't. And then the scene kind of pans out, and you just see, like, the uh, the grape juice, like, flowing out yes. of the vat, which, once again, is foreshadowing what's to come. Uh -huh. Water to wine. Ooh, cool. I know I said whenever we were watching it that I really love Simon and Eden's relationship. I just think it's so cute. Um, and I really like how they portray that. So, I think, yeah. Cool. 
Uh, well, then we finally get to meet two more characters who are going to be significant. I don't think really anywhere else in this season, but they will be significant coming up in season two. Mm -hmm. uh, and these characters are Thomas and Rama. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, these are two people who, they're not a couple or anything, but they definitely have some good chemistry going on there. Yeah. Uh, and there's definitely some fan theories out there where this is basically the first, um, the first ship. That people have been pushing uh, mm -hmm. in the chosen, you know, fan bases have their like their ships where they're, yeah. they're shipping people. They're shipping Thomas and Rayma, uh -huh. um, but they're not a couple. They're just like partners, um, you know, who are like basically they're loading up their stuff to mm -hmm. go to the wedding. And Thomas is saying, "Hey, um, sh we should bring four jars instead of three, just in case one of the jars breaks on the right. way. We want to make sure we have enough to provide for everybody." And Rayma says, "Hey, uh, the people couldn't afford it." But Thomas explains, I would willingly take that out of my own money. I don't want to embarrass the people. Mm -hmm. So we get to see some of Thomas's good heart there. You yeah. know, he's like, hey, I would I would rather pay for that out of my own money mm -hmm. just so these people aren't embarrassed in the event that one of the jars breaks. Right. She says, everything's going to be fine. Uh -huh. Spoiler alert. It's not going to be fine. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Yeah. Uh, but we cut from them. And we see Mary and Dinah, who are now setting up for the wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dinah explains that they don't have a whole lot of money, but their future daughter-in-law comes from a very wealthy family. They have more discussion, but basically that's the whole premise that you need to know. They're just setting up the fact that the Groob's family, mm -hmm. not wealthy. The bride's family, wealthy. Yep. Therefore, if things go poorly, that's going to really mess up the Groob's family's name. Not only here at the wedding, but really it's going to mess up their whole thing in the entire culture. You know, you have to remember this is very much an honor shame culture. Right. You know, if you get shamed, if something bad happens, people are going to look down on you for like the rest of your life and yeah. for generations to come. And so they really need this party to go well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it is what it is. They're just kind of setting that up to where it's like, oh, there's some tension already. You want this to go well. I do like that they just, you know, they added a little bit more depth to it. So yeah. there's still a little bit higher stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we cut to Simon and Andrew walking. And they're discussing what to do with their lunches, mm -hmm. right? Because Andrew, uh, if, if you remember the previous episodes, he has experienced Jesus before. And he is, like, nervous and giddy. And he's like, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, my gosh. I like Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so he's nervous. And he's just, like, freaking out. He's like, do I need to hold my lunch in my hand? Do I need to put it over my shoulder? Uh -huh. Simon's like, put it over your shoulder. <laughs> and Andrew's like, but what if nobody else brought lunches? And Simon's like, dude, you need to calm down. Yeah. You know, like, it, it, it's going to be fine. Like, mm -hmm. maybe everybody will just understand that none of us have traveled with the Messiah before. It's going to be cool. Yeah. So Andrew's overthinking it. Simon, he's trying to be confident. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of have this real moment before them where Simon says, I don't want to let him down. Yeah. And Andrew says, I don't want to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And Simon says, we'll probably both do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And he says, do you remember how Abba taught us how to fish? Mm -hmm. And Andrew's like, well, we just had to watch him. And then we had to teach ourselves and we messed up a lot. He's like... Exactly. That's how it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, but this, once again, is... I, I like how they're fleshing out Simon's character. Mm -hmm. Because, once again, it's consistent with Scripture. Yeah. Because you have the two things, right? Simon says, I don't want to let him down. Andrew says, I don't want to do it wrong. Mm -hmm. I like how they have two different things they're saying there. Mm -hmm. Simon's whole focus is on letting Jesus down. He says, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. His focus is on Jesus and pleasing Jesus. Andrew... He's focusing on things more how a Jew would probably think about things. I just want to do things right versus wrong. Yeah. So Simon, his focus is actually on the better thing. Right. He's thinking, I just want to please Jesus. Mm -hmm. But whenever you look at the character of Simon throughout the Gospels, in some ways that actually comes to hurt him because he's so desperate to please Jesus that he almost misses out on Jesus' teachings. Right? Mm -hmm. So whenever it comes to Jesus washing his feet, he's like, Lord, no. You'll, like, you'll have nothing to do. I'm not letting you wash my feet. And Jesus is like... If I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. He's like, then wash my entire body. And Jesus the is like, extremes. <laughs> yeah, he just goes to the extremes, but it's all out of a desire to please Jesus. Uh -huh. And Jesus is like, no, I just need to wash your feet. Then later on, Jesus is like, what if he's going to betray me? And Peter's like, I will never betray you. I would go to death for you. And Jesus is like, you're going to deny me three times later tonight. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then later on, Jesus is like, I need you to stay awake for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Simon's like, okay, I'm going to stay awake. And he falls asleep three times. So whenever they come to arrest Jesus, what does Simon do? He's like, ah, pulls out a sword, goes off to probably cut off this guy's head, yeah. misses, cuts off the guy's yeah, ear. Yeah. And he's just trying to like defend Jesus, trying to like probably make up for falling asleep and trying to prove that he would die for Jesus. But then Jesus is like, dude, put the sword up. <laughs> I told you to have a sword for defense. Yeah. Don't you know I could call down the angels from heaven? Uh -huh. Like, chill. Uh -huh. But you do see that's exactly Simon's character. All he wants to do mm -hmm. is please Jesus, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it shows how we have to 
desire that, but we also have to be mature and we have to allow our desire to please him be dictated by what he has commanded. Mm -hmm. Really, the issue with Simon is that he desires to please Jesus, but he's kind of just doing it in his own way and he's mm -hmm. trying to impress Jesus. Yes. But I, I just like the little details there where they're very subtle. He realizes Jesus is a gracious person, but he says, I just don't want to let him down. Like, I don't want to do something that will disappoint even his grace itself. Mm -hmm. They're still kind of freaking out about all this stuff and talking about, you know, the whole, you know, yeah, we're going to just like, just like when we watched our dad, learned how to fish, we messed up. That's how it's going to be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then the other disciples start teasing them because it turns out they've been standing there this entire time. Yeah. And they're like, y'all are very entertaining to watch. And they're yeah. like, how long have y'all been standing there? And they're like, a while. Uh -huh. uh, and then this is when Jesus walks up and he's like, great day for a wedding, eh? Uh -huh. So <laughs> uh, casual. Yeah. Jesus just Funny. walks up around the corner by himself. He's like, hey guys, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Uh, and this is where he kind of introduces. He's like, okay, Thaddeus, James, John. All these are people. And they have another James. Now he's up in the tree. The figs. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got figs for the journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really funny line. Figs for the journey. But I think the reason why they focused on him, like to where you even remember he's like, oh, up in the tree with figs, mm -hmm. is because they actually had to recast James between episodes four and five. So this yeah. is James, the brother of John. Mm -hmm. And he was played by a different person in episodes one through four versus mm -hmm. five through eight and going uh, into season two. Uh, and I think that's just because of scheduling conflicts. I think the first guy couldn't come back. And so I think they just did this to reintroduce him be like, yeah. oh, James. And then that's why even whenever he gets down, Jesus is like, oh, we have two Jameses. What are we going to do here? So they're just belaboring the fact, James, that's James. Uh -huh. <laughs> he doesn't look the same, but that's James. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I just letting you know that. And... He says, okay, so we got two Jameses here. How are we going to resolve the situation? And the bigger James, the one that just jumped out of the tree, he says, well, you could call me Big James and this one Little James. Mm -hmm. And Jesus turns to Little James and he says, yeah, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, I'll go by Little James. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, ah, and a sense of justice too. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming they did this because they're in biblical history. There is a person who was called James the Just. Mm -hmm. uh, he was like a leader of the early church. And I think people debate about who that was because there's a bunch of different Jameses in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and really the name James just comes from the name Jacob. So there's this debate whether James is this James from the 12 or James the brother of Jesus. Like who mm -hmm. is James the just? And so I think that they're just like, that's kind of a little Easter egg. Oh, yeah. a sense of justice too. Oh, maybe this is James the just. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but then they start traveling. And this is basically just showing the, the group getting together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the chosen getting together. Mm -hmm. ah. Ah, yeah. uh, and so they start traveling. So Mary and Dinah, now they're looking at the Koopa? Yes. Chupa. No, Koopa. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I had to look, look it up. up. Yeah. yeah, and then they said it later on. Okay, so Mary and Dinah, they're looking at the Koopa that they bought, and basically it's just this big, like, frame. It looks like a canopy. Yeah, yeah. That's the word. Yeah. yeah. So basically it's yeah. just this wooden canopy that they bought, and it's shabby. It's not very good. And Mary, she says, I know how to talk to carpenters, right? So let me go talk to them. Yeah. Which that's kind of, you know, a little Easter egg mm -hmm. there to, you know, her, her husband was a craftsman and carpenter, mm -hmm. uh, as what is her son and right. probably a lot of her children, mm -hmm. right? She's like, hey, uh, I know how to speak to carpenters. If you want, I can go talk to them and we can get this made better. Mm -hmm. But Dinah says, no, it's fine. I'm happy with it. It's what I paid for. I couldn't yeah. afford much better, so it, it'll be fine. Uh, the wife's mother, right? Uh -huh. So the wife's name is Sarah, right? So right. Sarah's mother, Higla, comes up. And she says that she came ahead of Abner, which is Sarah's... There's just a lot of people here. The wife's mother shows up saying that she came ahead of the wife's father so that he could, she could make sure everything was done according to how he wanted. Right. And you can see that Dinah is not really liking this. And Dinah, once again, is the groom's mother. <laughs> yes. Uh, so there's some tension between the in-laws. Yeah. Right? And Dinah, she does not like this. She's like, you know what? If there was a day where maybe his opinion didn't matter, it would be today. Mm -hmm. And you can tell Higla's like... Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. My bad. I, I think I... Sorry. Higla reception boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Uh, and then it kind of cuts away from that. But they're just letting you know, once again, they're building the tension to where you're like, yeah. ooh... You this party it. really yeah. needs to go well. It needs to go super well. Yeah. Uh, and so then they continue. We, we cut back to Jesus and the disciples. And they're, once again, they're walking on their merry little way. Mm -hmm. And Jesus and, well, Simon comes up to Jesus. And he's like, so who's going to be at this thing? I bet there's going to be some wealthy people there. There's pretty important people. And yeah. Jesus says, the most important and powerful person I've ever known is going to be there. Mm -hmm. My mother. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew's like, isn't your mother from Nazareth? And Jesus looks back. He's like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Simon says, hey, 
um, you know, Jesus, this could be an important opportunity to gain some more followers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like going to this wedding, there might be some wealthy people there, some yeah. people you could talk to. Simon's trying to be like uh, his, his wing, yeah. wing man. <laughs> yeah, but once again, Simon trying to impress Jesus. He's yeah. trying to think practically. And you got to remember, they didn't know what the Messiah had come to do. They thought that he was coming to start a revolution, uh, yeah, like a physical revolution to overtake yeah. the Romans. So he's like, hey, if you want some benefactors to get you an army, mm -hmm. better start here. But Jesus, he says, this is not my day. Like, he doesn't, he's not, like, trying to correct him or anything. Yeah. Um, this could be a point where they could have easily had Jesus be like, I didn't come just for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. But instead, he doesn't go there. He just says, it's not my day today. Yeah. You know, no, today is all about the couple, so we're going to let it be about them. Right. Uh, and so Andrew, this is whenever uh, he asks if the couple realizes how fortunate they are to have the Messiah attending their wedding. And this is when we get to Jesus recounting the story that you mentioned earlier. You know, he says, well, considering that I cracked my head open at Asher's house back when we were children, I doubt they recognize that I'm that important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Jesus turns around. He says, do you think much of your childhood friends? Uh -huh. And then this is when Simon says, oh, Andrew doesn't have any childhood friends. And Andrew's like, I don't remember anybody hanging out with you either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you just get the banter back and forth between brothers and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like you mentioned earlier when we were talking about it, uh, I like that they're fleshing out Jesus here, and they're mm. just putting in a little detail about, oh, yeah. yeah, I cracked my head as a kid. Yeah. Because absolutely. those are details you don't think about, right? Oh, Whenever you yeah. think about Jesus, especially how he's usually portrayed, we usually just see him being, you know, the very Buddhist-like, hello, everybody, you know? Whenever, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah, blessed are the poor in spirit for those of the kingdom of heaven. It's like, no, this was a real guy. Yes, he's God in the flesh, but he's God in the flesh. Yeah. He's a human you know, truly God, truly man. I like that they just, like, flesh him out. They're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he probably doesn't think much of me because I cracked my head open at his house, and so he doesn't think I'm anything special. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, as Christians, we read the Bible, and especially the Gospels, and we think, how did people not know that Jesus was the Messiah? Yeah. Like, why would, like, look at the things he's doing. Yeah. How would you not believe it? Right here is the explanation. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you grew up with a person for 30 years. Right? He was your best friend. You grew up with him from childhood. Mm -hmm. You knew him. You knew him. You knew his parents. You knew his brothers. Mm -hmm. You knew that time whenever he cracked his head open. You knew whenever he had a runny nose. You'd seen him at all these different times. You remember that one time he got lost and his parents had to go back to Jerusalem and find him and they got yeah. onto him. You remember all this stuff about him. All of a sudden he starts showing up and performs miracles. Yeah. The first thing you're probably going to think is not, oh, he's God. You're going to think, oh, what's this guy up to? Mm -hmm. This is weird. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, he's making these bold proclamations. You're like, dude, get off your high horse. Who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. You grew up in Nazareth with us. Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? All because you have, like, a good voice and, you know, you can speak and have these cool teachings. You think that you're hot stuff? Yeah. So, you can see where they come from. So, I like that they just include that. Like, he's like, nah. You know, Asher probably doesn't think anything special of me coming. I cracked my head open whenever I was a little kid. He just, I'm just a regular guy to him. Mm -hmm. It reminds you, whenever you're reading scripture, you have to remember... The people in scripture did not realize that the Messiah was supposed to be God in the flesh. Right. Uh, and even if they did, they probably would not have understood how that would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't think that God could come in the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, they just thought the Messiah was just supposed to be this, like, guy who showed up to defeat the Romans. Yeah. And so Jesus isn't really fitting that bill. Um, he's kind of doing something radically different. And so he's like, nah, they, they won't understand who I am. This is where he turns to Mary. He's like, oh, Mary, uh, you ever had any brothers? And how do you like traveling with these men? And she's like, oh, I've always wanted brothers. And he's like, oh, well, soon you'll have 12. Yeah. And this line felt kind of random to me. But I think they were just kind of being like, hey, don't worry. We know he has more than seven disciples. Mm -hmm. There's going to be 12. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what they're like, oh, um, 12. And Jesus is like, you'll see. Mm -hmm. And then he says, yeah, so soon you'll have 12 brothers. We'll see how you like it then. Yeah. Uh, and there's like little Easter egg to be like, hey, come back for season two. There will be 12 <laughs> eventually. <laughs> uh, and so this one, he's like, oh, look, Cana's right over the hill. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're approaching, right? Uh-oh, the wedding's about to happen. What's going to happen? We'll have to see. Tension is building. Yes. <laughs> uh, so now we cut once again back to Mary and Dinah, and they're setting up the Koopa Mm -hmm. And Mary here, I, I like this is just like a very brief, like one or two lines at the beginning of, like you can tell that we're picking up in the middle of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, me and Joseph would have had a wedding. Mm -hmm. And Diana's like, well, why didn't you? And Mary's like, well, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this is cool uh, because just right there, it immediately got me asking questions. Because I was thinking, oh, like it reminds you, Mary and Dinah have had this relationship. They've known each other since kids. Right. That means Dinah knew Mary Whenever all of a sudden she showed up pregnant and she wasn't married yet. Mm -hmm. And so Mary's like, yeah, we didn't have a public wedding. 
because I was pregnant, if you don't remember. Yeah. Uh, and so having a public wedding, that would have kind of shamed Joseph. And so they're kind of explaining, like, how did this whole thing happen to where Jesus isn't just constantly walking around with, like, a shadow or a storm cloud over his head, Mm -hmm. you know, where people are like, oh, this guy, he was born under weird circumstances, which whenever you read the scriptures, it actually seems like people did understand that he was born under weird circumstances because there's some things that the Pharisees say to him, especially in the Gospel of John, Mm -hmm. where it seems like they're kind of accusing him of like, hey, they're like, we at least know where our father came from. Where's your father? And Mm -hmm. you're like, what do they know here? I like that they're just including this because what Mary's talking about is her virgin birth, right? Right. She didn't have a public wedding to Joseph because she was pregnant at the time. Right? She's like, yeah, I was still betrothed to Joseph. I got pregnant even though I was a virgin. How are you going to explain that to everybody? So Joseph and I, we kind of got married in a private ceremony. So it was kind of out of the public eye and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I just thought it was cool how you kind of jump in in the middle of the conversation. Yeah. Dinah's like, oh, well, I would have (laughs) gone. And Mary's like, thanks. What a good friend. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But then Mary says if Joseph were there, he would have been so proud of them. Mm -hmm. Right? So proud of her and of Rafi. And uh, she'd be like, oh, it's... Joseph would have been so proud, which this is alluding to the fact that Joseph is most likely dead right. at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, because um, that scene that we saw at the beginning of this episode, that is the last time we physically see Joseph in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. He's mentioned a few times later on, but it's just in passing. Like It's like, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Mm-hmm. Right? We don't actually see Jesus, uh, Joseph interacting. Right. And really, the events that happen in John chapter 2, the things that happen in this episode would incline us to believe that Joseph is probably dead at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so she's just like, yeah, if Joseph were around, he would be so proud of you. Mm -hmm. So it means that, you know, um, Jesus' dad is dead. So Joseph has died at this point. They don't explain how. Uh, They don't need to. The Bible doesn't. But most Mm -hmm. likely Joseph is dead. And so I like that they just kind of address that. Also, I don't know if you noticed this. Mm -hmm. It it just clicked in my head. The guy that they had playing Joseph in this episode was the same guy they had playing Joseph in The Shepherd. Uh, in like the Christmas special. Oh wow! Yes. I didn't even see that. Yeah, the person playing Mary is somebody different, and I think yes. the reason I think they cast her because they wanted somebody who could play somebody who looked really young, mm-hmm. but also somebody who looked thirty years older yeah, at the same. Like yeah. they, like they needed somebody who could play both. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did that, but the person who plays Joseph is the same person from The Shepherd. I didn't even think of that. Yes. Until you said that. That is. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, it just clicked in my head uh, for some reason nice. just now. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if you haven't watched The Shepherd, we actually did the breakdown of that episode it's as well. Good. It's good. Really um, cool. And so. Mary says, if Joseph were here, he'd be so proud of you. And she explains that Jesus is coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is where they kind of talk back and forth. And it's exactly how you can imagine two mothers talking about their kids. Yeah. Uh, she says, yeah, he's coming to the wedding. And he's bringing some friends. Uh-huh. And, His students. Uh, yeah. And then uh, Dinah's like, oh, I'm sure he's such a great craftsman. And he's like, and Mary says, well, yeah, he's a pretty good craftsman when he's not working. And then, like, Dinah's like, what? And she's like. He has a calling. <laughs> like, uh-huh. it, it's it's exactly how mothers Proud talk. Mother. Like, oh yeah. And then she's like, yeah. He has a calling. He's he's doing the Lord's work. Mm-hmm. And um, she's like, I don't really know what all it entails, but it's kind of cool. And then Dinah says, oh, I bet he's so handsome. And Mary's like, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's it's cool because you feel that motherly bond. They did a very good job at this. Once again, I, I don't know how the whole writing team works, but mm-hmm. you can tell they actually they really understand relationships. Yes. More than a lot of shows do. Uh, and it might be because they're being able to spend more time. It's a very character-driven show. Mm-hmm. Like, not a whole lot of plot happens yeah. throughout the episodes. It's more dialogue and character-driven. Yeah. And so they get to spend a lot of time on this, whereas a lot of shows you see nowadays, they don't do that. And so whenever a person is playing, like, like whenever you see, like, a mother and child interacting, they don't always feel, like, related. Yeah. Whereas whenever you just see them talking about Jesus, you can be like, oh yeah, this is, this is Mary. Like mm-hmm. this is, you know, she grew up with Jesus for 30 years and she's, mm-hmm. just, she's proud of him. She's like, oh yeah, yeah it's, it's my boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think throughout the entire episode, like that's one of my favorite things mm-hmm. is getting to see Mary and Jesus's relationship. Cause that's something I feel like if I would have been writing the show, I wouldn't have really thought to develop that. But that's something that, like, it for some reason has such a big impact. Mm -hmm. But I think it's because we can relate to it. Like, we can relate to our relationships with our mother, and you can see, you know, that reflected in the show. And it's also a thing they have to be very careful with how they um, portray, mainly because of the theological disputes, specifically between Catholics and Protestants. Mm -hmm. Because I know Dallas Jenkins, like, he comes more from, like, our type of background, where he's being more, like, evangelical Protestant. But I think that they're trying to make this as available to different perspectives as well. And so I know that they, you know, they also have Catholics Mm -hmm. voice their opinions and stuff too. And Catholics, they venerate Mary much more highly. Whereas like, you know, Protestants, we would agree that Mary is awesome. And you see that in scripture and she is amazing, but we would not, you know, say that she was sinless 
And yes. like, like there's certain things like the Immaculate Conception and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We, we would not agree to those things of Catholic doctrine. Yeah. So you you got to realize they're having to be very careful with how they portray Mary here because they want to honor both. Uh, while not, like you don't want to exalt her too highly, but you also don't want to, you know, just hurt everybody's feelings by unnecessarily making her too normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, to be fair, she was not just a normal person. Like God chose her for a reason. Oh, yes. uh, And you can see that with both Mary and Joseph. They were chosen for a reason to raise Jesus. Yes. Uh, so she was amazing. I wouldn't have thought to flesh that out. Like, I would want to, but I'd also just be very nervous about it. But I I think they did a very good job of that. Uh, And it's very respectful to, I think, really both perspectives. This is whenever Dinah gets called away. Yes. uh, Because Rafi says, hey, the wine vendors and all Mm -hmm. that, you know, those people are here. Mm -hmm. And so they get to meet Thomas and Rama. I keep wanting to call her Rama. It's Rama, right? It's Rama. Yeah, it's Rama. Okay. So Rafi and Dinah, they meet Thomas and Rama. Like I said, a lot of character names in this show. There's, uh, so, like, many. there's, there's, there's so, so many. There's so many, and you there you have to, right? you got to introduce people. You're trying to introduce all the people in Scripture, but also more people outside of Scripture. To develop, yeah. uh, And it's like, okay, so Rafi and Dinah, these are the groom's parents. They go to meet Thomas and Rama, who are the people bringing the wine and the food and stuff. Yes. And at this point, whenever Rafi and Dinah are walking up, Thomas and Rama kind of have this exchange mm-hmm. where, um, you know, Thomas calls Rama beautiful, and she kind of looks at him like, Huh? Yeah. And then whenever Rafi and Dinah walk up, Rama says, oh yeah, Thomas, he's always on time. And Thomas is like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like little things where I'm like, it seems like they're kind of like... Yeah, have this connection? Yeah, it kind seems of. like they really do have this connection. Uh, I, I really, they just recently had a live stream with the two actors and actresses. Yes, and they yeah. had a they had a and a between them. And they were saying like, so are y'all going to get together? And they were like, if so, it'd be like a much more long-term thing. Uh-huh. But I was like, nah, like... I don't think whenever I've watched this these, this episode in the past, mm-hmm. I've really picked up as much on the connection. Yeah. But watching it this time, I'm like, yeah. Uh-huh. Like, there's certain things where, like, they kind of pause and look at each other. And, like, yeah. even earlier, whenever Thomas was like, we're a team. And she's like... I was like... <laughs> I was like, man. Like, I, I see it. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> and obviously, once again, I do want to address Thomas, obviously. This is going to be... Who, for some reason, we always know him as Doubting Thomas, even though I think he gets a bad rap. This eventually is going to be one of the disciples of Jesus. This is, since we try to address the biblical stuff, Yeah. this is a fictional backstory they're giving to him. Mm-hmm. And they're just using this as a way to get him to know Jesus. Yes. We don't know how Thomas got to know Jesus. We just know he was one of the disciples. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is them just like kind of fictional. Like they're just interweaving him into the story so that they're introducing him while also... Um, you know, actually going through a story of the Bible. like So it's actually yes. really cool how they're doing it. They're saying, okay, we know this story has to take place, and we don't know where this character comes in, mm-hmm. so let's just introduce him in the story. Mm-hmm. And so I like how they did that. You know, like they're in, they're taking two things, they're like, let's bring them together. Because they yeah. can do that without contradicting scripture. They can. For all we let's know, there's like a one in a million chance that they are spot on, and this is how he got to know Jesus. Mm-hmm. I doubt it. But um, I, I think it's really cool they did that, right? So it doesn't contradict scripture, but it also isn't blatantly scriptural, but it also doesn't affect anything theologically, right? right. So to me, yeah. those are all things where it's like check mark, check mark, check mark. That's why I like this show. Because yeah. I don't like whenever they, like if they contradict scripture, that's no bueno. Mm-hmm. Um, but really the only times they do contradict scripture is more like, geographically or chronologically right where they'll like put something in jerusalem that took place in capernaum or flip-flop or they'll put one event before the other or, yeah but that stuff's not as important really it's the theological importance that i'm really worried about they share some of the wine with rafi and dinah and after praying they taste it and they're like oh this is great mm-hmm. uh and this is where rama explains that they have two jars and one of the lesser which immediately lets you know uh oh, one of the jars cracked. <laughs> Thomas is probably mad. <laughs> yeah, he's probably not too happy about that. Uh, yeah. He's like, I told you so. Yeah. Uh, so they, they have two jars and then one of the lesser. So I guess they were able to salvage part of the jar and it's got, oh, we got a little bit left. Yeah. Um, and then Thomas explains that they will serve the best wine first. Mm-hmm. Right? He's like, hey, as is typically what we're, you know, we're going to do, we'll serve the best wine first. Once people have had their fill, then we'll serve some of the less wine so they don't, you know. Notice as much. Yeah. And he's like, do you understand? And Rafi's like, ah, yes. Oldest trick in the book. Uh-huh. Uh, because that's how things were. Like, that is what they would do back then. And that's something that, once again, that comes from scripture. We have this address, and it's actually a big portion of the whole final, like, the, the climax of this whole yes. episode. Right? Yes. Uh, and so, Thomas asks if there are still supposed to be about 40 or 50 people. Right? So, they're giving us a number just to let us know. All right. And so, so, they were already planning on 40 or 50 people, and that was supposed to be for three jars. Right? Right? Now they're down to two jars, so 40 or 50 people, they're already going to have a tough time. 
right? And you got to remember, this is just, it's a multiple day long thing. It's not right. just one day. Yes. This is, weddings nowadays. They're like a week long. <laughs> yeah, well, weddings nowadays are much shorter. Back then, they're like a week long thing. And so yeah. they're like, okay, 40 or 50 people. And we're already going to be pushing it because, you know, we got two jars. But they don't tell them that, right? They're just saying, we just want to make sure what we're dealing with here. Yeah. And they say, yeah, 40 or 50 people should be good. Uh, and Robbie <laughs> says, uh, let me take you to the master of the banquet. Uh-huh. And so they go to meet the master of the banquet. And really, um, biblically, this is just, we don't have these people nowadays. But basically, it's, I guess, the equivalent of like an MC, mm-hmm. right? So it's, you know, the mas- master of ceremony. You know, the person who's kind of, you know, on the microphone, like the DJ and stuff. Uh, but this guy would also just be the one who's making sure that everything in the ceremony is going well. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they kind of introduce that here to where they don't belabor it. But it, it's something that we don't have a lot in our current wedding ceremonies. Mm-hmm. But I guess it could be the person who's like... The, uh, the event planner like or the wedding the, planner. Yeah, yeah, the wedding planner. So, somebody who's in charge of all the stuff, right? The coordination of it all. Yeah. And so then Jesus arrives. Uh, he walks in. He's like, Mother. And they like hug and he picks her up. He's like, Oh, and you're so like, sweet. Yeah. And then he introduces um, his mother, Mary, to Mary Magdalene, as well as all of his disciples. And I know this was funny because we were watching it on YouTube and it cut to an ad. Oh, yeah. And then right after the ad, we skipped the ad and then it just cut to John the Baptist and Nicodemus again. And we're like, did it skip something? Yeah. But it turns out that was just like a very brief scene. It just like, just it just jumped cut, really quickly yeah. because it was like, oh, mom, hey, here's my disciples. Boom, John and Nicodemus. I was like, whoa, <laughs> what just happened here? Yeah. Uh, but we, we rewound it and sure enough, it just, it was a very short scene there. Yeah. But very cute scene. Yeah, right? I loved it. And so here we pick up where John and Nicodemus left off. And at this point, Nicodemus has recounted his story to John about the thing with Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. And he's just playing through it again. He's like, yes, I... I went in there myself. I tried to cast the demons out. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. And then this is where John the Baptist gets excited. And he turns around and starts walking. He's like, ah. It, like, I don't know why. The actor, he like breathes a lot. Yeah. But it for some reason, it fits the character of John the Baptist for it me. It does. He's just like, ah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I feel it. Uh, to so where he's, 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 he's like, honey and locust. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, okay. Yeah, this guy lived in the world right. and he's honey and locust. <laughs> um, and so Nicodemus is like, why are you so excited? And he says, if he is healing in secret, the public signs cannot be far off. Yeah. And I, I did want to comment on this uh, because it seems, I, I like what they're doing here. Uh, this seems like their way of getting around the fact that Jesus has already performed other miracles. Right. So they're putting this very big emphasis on the fact that there are private miracles and public miracles. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas, I, I do believe that the the wedding in Cana, I believe that was his first public miracle. Mm-hmm. But whenever you actually look at the context of it in John chapter 2, it really can't even be called much of a public miracle. Because mm-hmm. only the disciples and the servants know about it. Uh, and we'll see that whenever I actually read the passage. Right. Yes. So, it, like, we call it the first public sign, but really it's not that public. Yeah. So, whenever John says that, I do think he's clarifying in John chapter 2 that that was Jesus' first actual miracle. Yes. Uh, so... Um, really what's happened is that their chronology is kind of shifted around a little bit. Uh, so I would say that the healing of Mary Magdalene and then the calling of Peter and stuff, that would actually all happen after this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is actually what I addressed in the last episode whenever I was talking with Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Really the chronology of the whole uh, situation here, it seems like like Peter, James, John, Andrew, like some of them were following John the Baptist for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jesus, he comes, he gets baptized, he goes out into the wilderness, he comes back after being tempted... Uh, and then at this point, this is whenever John the Baptist points out Jesus mm-hmm. and is like, hey, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Go get to know him. And then Simon, Andrew, James, John, stuff, they go get to know Jesus. Yep. And Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to a wedding tomorrow if y'all want to come with. Mm-hmm. They go to the wedding and along the way they pick up like Philip and Bartholomew. Mm-hmm. And so now there's more of them. They go to the wedding. Jesus performs this miracle. And then after this, they all go their separate directions. Yeah. Right, and so after this miracle, like they've gotten to see who Jesus is, what he can do, mm-hmm. they go their separate directions, and then maybe a few months later, Jesus is walking along the shore. He comes across Simon and says, "Hey, uh, let's go out into the water and you cast your nets." Mm-hmm. So really, biblically, uh, whenever you take like the, the really the issue is that you have four different accounts: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm-hmm. and they're not really necessarily telling things chronologically. Um, they're, they're, they have different purposes, right? And so uh, it's it's not an issue that they're not telling things chronologically. That's just how we more do it nowadays in our current culture. Right. Back then, like sometimes things could be thematic or something like that. And we even do that nowadays as well, too. If you're reading a history textbook, mm-hmm. you're not always going to read things chronologically. You're going to read things thematically yeah. and then they'll say, okay, and then go back here and stuff. So really, whenever you're trying to compare the Gospels, you're trying to figure out the best chronology. Yeah. And for my own studies, that seems to be the best way to make sense of it all. So it, it really seems like the reason why, because they say this multiple times in this episode. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
the public signs are starting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it basically is them trying to explain away, like, why did he already perform miracles? And they're like, well, that was just for, you know, that was just like Andrew and then a few people saw the whole catching of the fish and Mary alone saw the, mm-hmm. the demon thing. So those were private. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I see what you're doing there. I feel like what happened is they wrote episodes one through four. Yeah. And then going into episode five and through eight, they're like, oh, we really want to do the wedding. And then somebody was like, that was the first miracle. They're yeah. like, wait, so that that would have already happened? They're like, yeah. And they're like, well, we don't want to do a flashback. Public miracle. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and some, pe- some people would say that. Some people yeah. would, like, they have made that argument. But typically, I would say that um, the consensus is that the wedding happened first. And then later on, he went, like, really, the wedding was almost a way to get them to believe in him. And that's how, literally, the account ends. It says, the disciples saw this and they believed. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, cool. So then later on, Jesus goes and finds them. He calls them. They're like, it all of a sudden makes sense why Simon is like, yes, I'll mm-hmm. drop my nets and do it. Because it's not like his first time encountering Jesus. He's had time to think about this, and he knows I'm willing to make the commitment. Exactly. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting thing to just point out there. Yeah. Um, but John the Baptist, he, this is John the Baptist and Nicodemus talking, and this is just our first mention of this. But he says, if he's healing in secret, the public signs can't be far off. And then Nicodemus says, what is his name? Mm-hmm. And so this is where John the Baptist, he starts quoting Proverbs chapter 30. And he says, Who has ascended to heaven and has come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Mm-hmm. And then Nicodemus is saying, What are you talking about? Don't quote Solomon to me. Yeah. And he says, This is the words of Agur, son of Jacque. So he's kind of it's, he's kind of correcting Nicodemus there. Mm-hmm. Because he's like, Hey, I know Solomon collected the Proverbs, but these are the words of Agur. <laughs> Uh, So even whenever he's preaching out of John the Baptist can't help but correct Nicodemus. He says, finish the saying, finish this, you know, the words of Agur, son of Jacque. And Nicodemus says, what is his name and who is his son? Because that's how, that's, if you go on in Proverbs 30, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. And then John says exactly what follows after that. Mm -hmm. Surely you know. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what it says in the passage, right? Whenever you go read it, that's what it says. It says, surely you know. And Nicodemus says, you are careless with Torah. God does not have a son except Israel. Israel is his only son. They will put a man to death for blasphemy like that. Mm -hmm. What's happening here is this is a theme that, like, this is what Jews still believe to this day. Mm -hmm. Whenever you read about the suffering servant and different things that Christians would say, that's about Jesus, Jews would say, no, that's about Israel. Like, we are the suffering servant. Whenever it says God's son, it's talking about Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, They would not say that's about the Messiah. Uh, and you could see where they come up with that, right? Yeah. Um, but John the Baptist is like, I don't know, you might need to reconsider things, Nicodemus, uh-huh. uh, Nico. <laughs> uh, so Nicodemus says, you're careless with Torah. They put people to death for this. And this is where John the Baptist gets us that fulfillment of what had been said earlier. He says, mm-hmm. who will you? Who would be a terrible precedent for Rome to adjudicate. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's why Nicodemus said he came, right? He said, I came here so that Rome wasn't having too much power. Yeah. And John's like, ah, okay. Well, it seems like you're going to give him that power right now. <laughs> And then he says, all your life you have been asleep. Make straight the way for the king. He is here to awaken the earth, but some will not want to awaken. They're in love with the dark. I wonder which one you'll be. Mm-hmm. And this is probably an allusion to John chapter 1. You know, in the beginning was the word, was wor- the word was with God, the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then throughout all the Gospels, you have this co- this constant theme of light and darkness. Yes. And some people love the darkness, and they love to stay in the darkness. Mm-hmm. John the Baptist says, you better wake up, man. The king's coming, and he's coming for the people who want to walk in the light. Mm-hmm. Which one will you be? Mm-hmm. So he's giving a challenge to Nicodemus. And uh, Nicodemus turns, and he says, if this man is who you say he is, you need to leave, because your presence alone puts him in danger. Mm-hmm. And John the Baptist says, if you think he needs my help, you've heard nothing mm-hmm. and to me that's like that's like chill inducing you're like whoa yeah that was good yeah that was good yeah and then nicodemus leaves as john the baptist just kind of pray i can't tell if he's praying or laughing yeah yeah he kind of like looks up he's like ha. yeah <laughs> once again it's it's a person who grew up in the wilderness eating locusts and honey walking around in camel's hair and a leather belt yes so perfect good. like they did good casting here mm-hmm. uh, but he- i love like the banter back and forth because i feel like they are both definitely different characters, but they kind of almost have, like, the same sense of humor and, like, the persistence and, like, almost, like, the pridefulness kind of where they're like, no, like, I have to prove my point. So it's kind of fun to, like, watch them banter back and forth because they kind of have the same, like, mindset when it comes to, like, mm-hmm. 
how stringent they are on their beliefs. Yeah. So it's These are just fun. two stubborn guys coming together yeah. and they're butting heads and they're like, I'm not going to let you one up me. Who's more stubborn? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the funny thing. Whenever you get to John the Baptist, you have to realize he's an amazing guy, but he's also not perfect. <laughs> he's also very humble. Yeah. Right. So he's a very humble guy and Jesus praised him for that. And you actually see that throughout the gospels, especially in the gospel of John. Mm-hmm. But he's also a human. And we're, we see in the gospels that even he seemed to misunderstand who Jesus was yeah. in some extent. Like he, he seems to have thought that Jesus was also going to be a political leader and ruler mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. well. So I, I do like that. You know, you kind of see the, uh, you know, the two guys trying to flex on each other. You got the yeah. young guy who just likes criticizing everybody. And then you got the, uh, the old man who thinks he knows everything. Yeah. Uh, but then we cut back to the wedding uh-huh. and Tom's is ordering people around and people are out there singing. And this took me a second to figure out That's what they were singing, but it seems to me that they were quoting from, uh, like they're singing from Jeremiah 33 mm-hmm. verses 10 to 11. And I don't know if this is a thing that people have adapted into music. Well, I know they have because uh, if anything, the people at the Chosen adapted yeah. it into music. Uh, but I don't know if this is a thing that, like, it's a Jewish song. Yeah. Uh, but basically it's saying, They shall be heard again in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, usually whenever they've been singing, they're singing from the Psalms, which makes sense. Because yeah. those are, like, the word Psalms means songs. Yes. Uh, so those were songs. And they are songs. But I'm not totally sure what they were doing there. But it's basically just, once again, they're giving you the cultural context. People are at this wedding. They're dancing around. They're singing. And they're singing scripture. What's going to happen? There's going to be singing in Jerusalem and in Judah. And what are they talking about? When the Messiah shows up. Mm -hmm. Ah. Uh, And so Rhema, uh, she comes in and she's like, hey, Thomas, you know that 40 or 50 headcount we said? Turns out there's 80. Yeah. And he's like. There's double. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He's like, no, you miscounted. She's like, yeah, maybe one or two, but that doesn't change much. Yeah. And he's like, hey, I advocated for a fourth char of wine. (laughs) And I was like, hey, Thomas. I don't know what your plans are if you're trying to win Rama over. And I know culturally that's not even how it worked. Like, yeah. dating and stuff and, like, wooing. That's much more of a common, like, modern day thing. Mm-hmm. But, dude, if you're trying to win her over, calling her out on stuff like that is probably not the way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> she probably realizes she messes up. You don't want to call her out. But he says, hey, I advocated for a fourth jar of wine. And just like, ah, okay. Like, once again, tension is rising. Mm-hmm. So now it's like they were planning on having enough for 40 or 50 people they didn't even have that much. Now there's yeah. 80 people there. It's like, uh-oh, and this is going on for multiple days. We have a predicament. We I have... wonder how it will be solved. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, uh-oh. Uh, and then the master of the banquet, he comes out. He offers his prayer. You know, mm-hmm. come on, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us fruit of the vine. Mm-hmm. And everybody begins to drink, and the party begins. Uh, and this is whenever we cut back to Thomas, and he's telling everybody, like, lighten your pores. Mm-hmm. Like, like, pour it, like, three quarters of the cup. Yeah. And then, like, if they ask for more... Tell them that you'll be back, but guess what? You won't. Yeah. My, you just won't be back. back. And I've actually seen a lot of memes that people have made out of that quote. Like, yeah. they're saying, like, oh, whenever you go on an awkward first date, tell them you'll be back, but guess what? You won't. <laughs> it's actually, there's a lot of really funny memes there. Um, and he compliments the banquet master and tells him, everything is fine. Because the guy comes in, and it's his job. He's like, how's everything going in here? And he's like, a okay, sir. Everything's going good, and I have to say, you're the best master of ceremony we have ever encountered in our lives the guy's like that's what i like to hear all right Uh y'all y'all keep at it and then abner comes in and he compliments rafi the father of the groom on the party Mm. right it's kind of tense at first because rafi's like oh i don't know Mm. and you know abner walks in with all of his like very evidently like luxurious wealthy clothing on it's like colorful Mm -hmm. and if you know anything about that culture if you were wearing something colored that meant something because that means you could afford to die right or have something died Mm -hmm. so he walks in he compliments rafi on the party but at the same time he's also insulting rafi and all his entire family he's like you know this really impressed me because your family kind of stinks i mean we don't have a high opinion about you because of your job and your wife because of who she is and then your son Eh, he's not he's all right i know our daughter loves him but y'all really are all terrible so we're all very impressed that you did this. And so it's a very backhanded compliment. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, he kind of like looks at him weirdly and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's just hard for me because my family is so amazing. And so, yeah. yes, I might be a little bit arrogant, but what can I say? I'm just born into wealth and we're just all amazing. And it's like, this guy, you don't want to, him to have the luxury of like being like, ha, ah, yeah. I knew you were worse. Yeah. Um, but fortunately, this guy is also drunk. Uh, not that that's a fortunate thing because being drunk is sinful, but... Uh, this guy is drunk, and he's like, oh, the Koopa looks fine to me. 
you said that it was stilted. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, he turns to his wife and says that. Uh, but he's drunk, so he can't yeah. tell. He's like, oh, it everything's looks fine stilted. To me. <laughs> everything's yeah. stilted, so it looks straight. <laughs> yeah, so his wife's like, oh, whatever. Um, so he's had his fair share of wine. Uh-huh. Uh, but then Rayma, uh, now she comes in. She's like, we need to dilute the wine, mm-hmm. right? Because we're really running out. So mm-hmm. we see progressively issue is getting worse. Mm-hmm. Problems are happening. Dude, what are we going to do? Yep. Yes. Uh, but they don't want the family to die of shame. And they also don't want themselves to die of shame. Because you got to realize, they have a company they're running here. Right. And yes, if things like things would go worse for the family. But they're also like, hey, this also is bad for us too. Mm-hmm. Because if things don't go well here, that's bad press for us. People aren't going to want to use this anymore. So yeah. we need to make sure this goes well. Yeah. Uh, and once again, we need to remember, this is all historically and culturally how it would have been. Like the woman's family is entrusting this woman to the man. Yes. Right? And so... The wedding was like the first opportunity for this man to show Mm -hmm. that he could provide for this woman. Right. And so you needed this wedding to go well. And it was also a big ceremony. Like, like people like weddings. Even nowadays, we like weddings. Mm -hmm. Back then, like I said, they're like a week long. Mm -hmm. And so the tension around any wedding, like you wanted it to go as well as possible. Running out of wine on the first day, not a good look. Not Not only does that publicly shame you in front of everybody in the culture, but it really does not look good on... Like, like, to the family. So you don't want to understate the importance of the situation. They've added a lot of context here to make the tension even higher. But even just in this situation, as it's found in the scriptures, this is a very intense moment. Yes. Right? And so uh, Thomas and Rama, they're just trying to think of different options. Mm-hmm. And that's where it cuts away. And now we get a montage of everyone dancing, and the day turns to night. We get some very intense music here. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Ah, ah, ah. There's always like the music in the show is always like, ah, ah, ah. it's like it's kind of funny. Inaudible words. Yes, it's inaudible. Um, and then we see Jesus goofing off with kids, and oh, yeah. I enjoy that. Yeah. I just always see Jesus hanging out with kids, and he's like, dude, it seems like he's doing like magic tricks. You know? Yeah, he was like, like stacking cups. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really funny. And then we see the disciples bonding. They're just kind of hanging out and talking. And this is where Simon, he's looking over at Jesus with the kids. And he says, they have no idea who they're with. Mm-hmm. And this is when Jesus, he's like stacking up all the cups. And then they fall. And then the kids are like, ah! And they're yeah. just having a fun time. <laughs> yeah. And then Thaddeus says, ah, oh, to be a child again, A. Eh? And uh, even you and I earlier today, we were reading in Matthew, Matthew where it's talking about childlike faith. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, ah, a nice little reference there too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then Mary says, I think we're the lucky ones. You know, they have to go home with their families tonight. We get to like be with him. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so Mary gets a lot of cool little one-liners here. Mm-hmm. And then Simon, he once again starts talking about how, like, you know, him and his brother becoming fishermen, how they watched their dad and they had to learn from their mistakes and mm-hmm. stuff. And then Mary says, we will watch him and watch him and watch him and watch him forever, I think. Uh, which is a good line. Some of her lines felt a little out of place to me. Yeah, I like, would agree at times. For some reason, every time she says something, it kind of like takes me out of it. Whereas in the earlier episodes, it didn't as much. Well, say the first two episodes, she felt a lot more... Yeah. Normal. Yeah. Like, normal lines, human-like, I guess you say. Yeah. Saying. I guess it could just be her, like, getting to know Jesus more and being like, wow, this guy is just amazing. Yeah. Uh, but th- that is something that I do want to address those every now and then, because I have so many good things to say about the show. I just want to point out just little details. I'm like, hmm, I don't know. But Andrew, he goes to get more wine, and then Simon says, I don't even know why I'm here. It's usually the student who chooses the rabbi, not the other way around. I'm not even a student. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this, once again, they're just giving you cultural context because that's how it was. Typically, a rabbi would start preaching around the age of 30, which is around the age Jesus was. Right. And usually, the student would choose the rabbi because they would go through, basically, religious school uh, up until the age of, like, 13 or 15. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they could choose to follow into, like studying like their trade whether it be like fishing or blacksmithing or whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, or they could choose like if they were more brilliant or something they could choose to follow a rabbi and they would choose the rabbi Mm -hmm. but really that would give us reason to think that some of the disciples were actually probably teenagers uh, in in, uh, realistically Uh, and there's other things in the gospels that would actually hint towards that Mm -hmm. Uh, and then little james explains that he was introduced to jesus by thaddeus Mm -hmm. Uh, and Thaddeus explains that he met Jesus on a work project, mm-hmm. right? And he says, okay, yeah, Jesus was a craftsman, and he invited Thaddeus to follow him because he was building a kingdom stronger than stone. Mm-hmm. It's a classic case of Jesus, like, talking, like, using physical language to, like, describe something, like, super spiritual, and uh-huh. people being like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but then he says he believed him, right? He says, like, yeah, I, I believed what he was saying, and so um, mm-hmm. I followed him. Yeah. And then Simon asks, like, so what were y'all working on? Mm-hmm. And Thaddeus says, I can't say this in front of a woman. And this is where, once again, Mary says, that, like, she's like, I've seen things that would turn your blood to ice. Yeah. And, and once again, it just, like, took me out of the, <laughs> like, I'm just like, like, it seems like they're trying to make her, like, I think the, the first few episodes made her seem more, like, I guess, innocent. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, I guess she's, like, almost trying to fit in with the boys. 
And so she's like saying, so she's like, yeah, I've always always wanted brothers. Uh I'd seen things that turned your blood to ice. And I'm like, I I don't know. I kind of, I I enjoyed the earlier Mary a little bit more. Yeah. Um, But I I get, there's, you know, they're just trying it out a little bit. And you have to remember there were also multiple months in between filming episodes four and five. And so the writing changed a little bit and stuff. Yeah. But she says, I've seen things that turn your blood to ice. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, no, tell us, what, what was it? And he's blood to ice. Uh-huh. Um, and then basically they guess on what they're working on, and it was a latrine, right? So they were building a bathroom, right? You know, and uh, Simon's like, "What? He was building a latrine, like the Messiah?" Uh, but Thaddeus explains that he was building a ramp for the elderly and crippled. And I'm like, "Of course, of course, that's what Jesus was doing. Yeah. He wasn't just building a restroom; <laughs> he was making a handicapped, accessible restroom." Yeah. I was like, "Go, oh, Jesus!" Yeah. Uh, and this is where once again we get them explaining the public and private miracles because Simon mm-hmm. says. Why didn't he just heal the crippled people? Right. You know, why didn't mm-hmm. he just heal them so that they didn't need a, a thing? Mm-hmm. And this is where um, Little James, right? Because now there's Big James, Little James. Yes. Little James explains, oh, well, that's because his public miracles haven't begun yet. Mm-hmm. As like Little James, he just knows that. He's like, oh, yeah, th- those haven't happened yet. That's, mm-hmm. that's coming later. And I'm like, okay, you, you, he told you this? Is yeah. that what he told you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you're doing there, writers. Uh, Simon asks, why not? And Mary says, if the wind blows left or right, man knows not why. And that, to me, seems like a reference to John chapter 3, which we'll get John chapter 3 later in this season as well. But in John chapter 3, um, whenever Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, mm-hmm. you know, and he's talking about being born again, uh, this is how Jesus describes being born again. He says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so it seems like that's kind of what that that's being a little slight reference to mm-hmm. there. Uh, and so Mary's like, yeah, you don't know where the wind blows left or right. You know, it just goes wherever. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what Jesus is doing, too. You don't know his ways. I don't know his ways. His hour has not yet come. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we cut to a brief scene where we see that they have run out of wine. Yep. They're like, uh oh, big panic. Major mode. issue. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, now it's time to really get serious here. Uh, and so. Then we cut to Andrew and Simon. They're coming to find Jesus. They're saying, the dance of Miriam is starting. We want to see if you want to come dance with us. And then Jesus is like, okay, cool. And Simon says, oh, well, there is a problem because Andrew dances like a donkey walking on hot coals. He's got two left feet. <laughs> and once again, they're just, I like that they're showing the brothers banter because oh, yeah. prior, like in the first four episodes, it was just mainly just drama. Like they just hated each other yeah. because they had like this whole debt thing looming over them and Simon mm-hmm. was just making dumb choices. Whereas now they're back to normal. They're with the Messiah. They're beginning to banter. Yeah. And I really like... If anything, the one thing the show's really contributed is just my appreciation for the difference in disciples. Because whenever you read them in the Gospels, yeah. you know about Simon, you know about John, you know a little bit about Philip and Bartholomew, but you don't really know much about the other disciples. You know about Judas Iscariot, you know about Thomas, yes. but really only a few of them get fleshed out. Mm-hmm. Some of them, they're just mentioned. It says like, oh yeah, they're amongst the 12, and that's their only mention in scripture. Yeah. You don't know anything else. So I do enjoy the show, like giving them different personalities and stuff, and I think mm-hmm. that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Simon's like, oh, yeah, uh, Andrew dances like a donkey, so you're going to have to teach him how to fix that. Uh-huh. Uh, but then Mary comes out, and she says, they've run out of wine. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, why are you telling me this? And Mary explains that the people will be humiliated. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, mother, my time has not yet come. And this is whenever it pans to her. Mm-hmm. And now she repeats what he said to her back in AD 12. I know, yeah, yeah. And she says, if not now, when? Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, this is when, you know, it does that zoom, zoom in, in on her face and she says, please. Right. So now it's like 18 years later or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, okay. Mm-hmm. And then Mary turns and tells the servants to listen to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is one thing I do. I do need to mention this because in the show, mm-hmm. uh, I, I like how they pretty much execute everything. But this is probably the first time where I'm like, ah, I, I didn't like the interaction. Mm-hmm. I like the filming, like just the scene as a whole. Yeah. I like it. But whenever you compare it to scripture, mm-hmm. I don't like it as much. And later on, I'm going to actually read the passage all the way through. But for right now, I'm just going to summarize the main issues I had. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and really, it lies in how Jesus interacts with his mother. Mm-hmm. Because the whole thing they've been doing here is they've been setting it up where him and his mom have this really deep bond. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, my mother and stuff like that. And so I thought they were setting it up perfectly to do exactly what you see in scripture. Mm-hmm. Which is, at this moment, it seems like Jesus is purposefully putting a distance between himself and Mary. Mm-hmm. Because whenever she comes to him asking him to do this task, he doesn't call her mother. He calls her woman. Mm-hmm. And it's a very noticeable thing. Mm-hmm. Because it seems like at this point, she comes up to him, she says, they've run out of wine, and he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? 
And nowadays, that sounds rude. I don't think he was being rude, but I do yeah. think he was being firm. Mm-hmm. He wasn't saying, like, like, whenever we say woman, mm-hmm. it's like, like that, it's, it's like, almost oh, that, it's almost insulting. Yeah. Uh, it would be more equivalent to ma'am. But almost, but even ma'am is almost a little bit too formal, like, for me. Like, I'm from Texas. I would say ma'am to anybody. I'm like, ma'am. Like, I would say ma'am to my mother, and it wouldn't be the same thing. Yeah. It's almost like if you took ma'am and woman and, like, mixed them together and met in the middle. It, yeah. it seems like that's what it would be. What he's doing is he's going out of his way to not call her mother. Mm-hmm. Because he's saying, what does this have to do with me? Mm-hmm. And he's clarifying, prior to this, I answered to you as my mother. Mm-hmm. Going forward, something new is happening. Mm-hmm. And so instead of... Him answering to her as his mother, she will now answer to him as her Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Because now it's like, yep, up until this point, it's been his, you know, just Jesus growing up. Mm -hmm. But now, this this moment, the wedding at Cana, this is the shift where he begins his public ministry. Right. Right? So, I don't know if this is his first public miracle. I think it's his first miracle uh, in Mm -hmm. scripture. I, I believe that it is truly his first miracle chronologically. But this is for sure the beginning of his public ministry. And so I think that the point in the Gospel of John is when he says woman to her, he's pointing out that to her. He's saying, yeah. woman, what does this have to do with me? Because prior to this, she comes up to him. Joseph's dead. He is her eldest son. He would be the person to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. So it would make sense why his mother comes to him. Mm-hmm. You know, if she's one in charge of the stuff, she has to come to him and be like, Jesus, I'm in a bind. I need your help. Mm-hmm. But at this point, he says, woman, what does that have to do with me? I no longer answer as your son. Now, I am a son of the Father who has come to do my Father's work. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, whenever Jesus enters into his public ministry in the Gospels, from this point onwards, he's always actually, anytime he interacts with his mother or any of his siblings, he's always actually putting a distance between them. He's never, he never calls them mother or anything. Like that instance I mentioned before, mm-hmm. his, his mother and his brothers and his sisters come to find him. Right. And they say, we want to see Jesus. And they think that like, that'll get them closer to him. And then whenever the people tell him, you would think that he'd be like, oh, let my family in. But instead he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? Mm-hmm. And he points at the people around him. He says, those who do the will of God. Mm-hmm. So he actually, he, he, he almost like turns them away. Yeah. And so that seems to be a big point. And, and it probably would have hurt Mary's feelings a little bit, you know, because mm-hmm. she would realize like the whole thing she says there, if not now, when? It seems like that's more what Jesus was doing in this moment in the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. It, it's totally reversed. So I thought that's what they were setting up. Whenever I watched this for the first time, I was like, oh, they're really showing the bond between them. And they're even showing that in the beginning whenever he says, it's not now when, because I thought they were setting it up for him to say it again to her. Right. And say, if not now, when? Mm-hmm. Uh, because she, like, in, in the Gospel of John, he does say, my hour has not yet come. Yeah. Right? But he's talking about his death. Right? And he knows that this will ultimately lead to his death. But he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then whenever she says to the servants, do what he says to you to do, it seems like she has accepted that rebuke, mm-hmm. right? So it's not that, like, her feelings might have been hurt, sure, but this testifies to how amazing Mary is. She ran with it because she was faithful to God. And she said, okay, I knew this day was coming. Now you are my Lord. And she still believed in him. So yeah. whenever he says, what does this have to do with me? He's not rejecting her. He's just saying, this technically doesn't have to do with me. Like, mm-hmm. this, that's your problem, not mine. Mm-hmm. So then she comes to him and saying, please take care of my problem." Mm-hmm. Right? If, if he was just her son, it would be both of their problems. But right. he says, woman, puts that distance. It doesn't have to do with him anymore. Mm-hmm. But she says, will you take care of my problem? And that's a beautiful thing because that's what we have to do with Jesus, right? We come to him and say, hey, I know this isn't your problem, but can you take care of my problem? Yeah. And then we just have to say, do whatever he says. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what she does. So that was the one thing where like, it, it felt odd to me because it seems like they actually almost purposefully changed it because he went out of his way to call her mother. Whereas whenever you're reading the Gospel of John... It is very notable. Like, you cannot read the passage without noticing that he calls her woman. Because yeah. it's weird. And yeah. it sticks out. So, uh, th- th- that was kind of odd to me that they that they did that. Because I was like, ah, I, I don't know. I-, I didn't really care for that too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I really like this story. And the way that they set it up, it would have been so perfect. Mm-hmm. Because they had that bond to where you almost could have just shown it on her face. Where he says woman. And she's like, do whatever he says. You know? And I was like, oh, that- it would have been so good. But... Uh, so if they could just just do a voiceover, right? Just it, instead of mother, just put woman, and yeah. then it, it'd, it'd, be, it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. I'd be totally fine with it. But it's just such a subtle thing. But it's whatever. Mm-hmm. So uh, she says, "Go and do whatever he says." Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the servants come up to Jesus, and he says, um, "Fill these jars with water." Mm-hmm. And this is where Thomas, being the sassy man he is, is like, oh, yeah, "We're yeah. out of wine, not water." I don't know if you missed the memo. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesus is like, "Okay, Thomas." 
Uh, I like this, this uh, right here. They've got a huge debacle in front of them. But Jesus is like, it's time to do a psychological character study. Mm-hmm. He's like, Thomas, you seem like a responsible person. And you can see Thomas is just not having this. Yeah. He says, we're in the midst of a crisis, and I was told you had a solution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Jesus is just like, oh, you seem like a responsible man. He's just like wanting to talk to... He, he's totally unworried, right? He's just yeah. like looking at it. He's like, okay, fill the jars of water. I want to talk to Thomas here. Uh-huh. Uh, and Jesus explains... Um, he says, do you know why these, you know, purification... Why the purification jars are made of stone? Mm-hmm. Uh, and Thomas is going like... What does that have to do with anything? And he's like, yeah. just answer the dang question, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, and so Thomas explains it, and it's all for Jesus' point here, right? The purification jars, they're made of stone because stone is pure, it won't stain or break, and it and it won't be made unclean, mm-hmm. right? And he, um, Thomas explains that these things are the same size as the amphora jars if they're filled to the brim, mm-hmm. right? And so once again, oh, this isn't filled to the brim anymore, but oh, man. Uh, I'm little, oh, it's like really liquidy too. Oh, I guess we've been talking for a while. Whoops. Um, but he says, okay, if you fill it to the brim, it's the same size. So Jesus says, fill it to the brim with water. Uh, I don't think they know what filling it to the brim means though, because later it on he reaches into it. It's not filled to the it brim. It wasn't filled to the brim. Um, but then uh, Thomas says, from the directions you provided, I see no logical solution to the problem. And Jesus says, It's going to be that way sometimes, Thomas. Uh, And once again, you have to remember, Thomas has never said his name to Jesus, first off. But then also, what Jesus said is kind of like, it it implies that they're going to have a future relationship, right? Like, they have, like, a working relationship. Like, it's going to be that way sometimes. He's he's like, what did you say? And then Jesus says, I do not rebuke you. (laughs) Which is funny, because that also implies that Jesus has reason to rebuke him, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, Thomas is more like, what the heck are you talking about? Like, why would I need to be rebuked? But Jesus is like, I don't rebuke you. Mm-hmm. It's good to ask questions, to seek understanding. I know a person like you in Capernaum, always counting, always measuring. Mm-hmm. Who's he talking about? Matthew. Matthew. Oh, yeah. and, and what? guess what? They haven't met each other yet. Yep. But Jesus says he knows Matthew. Ooh. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and then he says to Thomas, join me and I will show you a new way to count, a different way of seeing time. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, that's kind of like... I like what they're doing there. It's yeah. kind of cool. Uh, and once again, this is all fictional, right? Uh, Thomas, he becomes a disciple of Jesus. That is true. This wedding story, it happens. Those coming together, that's just a fictional way of them doing it. And I like the mm-hmm. interaction there. Yeah. And then we cut to a quick scene where people are beginning to notice the lack of wine. There's, you know, so there's talk going around. I think it's mm-hmm. Rafi. No, not Rafi. Um, Abner and Higla. They're like, oh. Uh oh, what's mm-hmm. going on here? Yeah. Uh, you know, drunk Abner's over here, like, mm, I need more wine. What's going on? Uh, and then we cut to Mary and Thaddeus, and they're kind of just sitting there, kind of like an intimate scene, you know, the firelight and stuff like that. And they're just talking about Thaddeus' backstory, how he left, like, his dad was a smith, mm-hmm. uh, but he left smithing to be- co become a mason, mm-hmm. right? And he's like, yeah, so, you know, everybody has to leave their father. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, uh, Mary says, oh, well, I bet masonry's harder. Mm hmm. Um, but then he says, masonry isn't harder, it's just more final. And then what we see going forward is actually going to, um, like what he says after this is going to take place as other scenes are unfolding. Yeah. It just becomes like voiceover narration, mm-hmm. right? And so he says, masonry isn't harder, it's just more final. If the smith wants to change the item, he just needs to put it in the fire and reshape it. Once you make that first cut into the stone, it can't be undone. It sets in stone a series of motions. What began as a single piece of stone starts its journey of transformation, and it will never be the same. Mm-hmm. And so what this is supposed to be a metaphor for is Jesus beginning his ministry, mm-hmm. right? Because once Jesus turns this water to wine, things will never be the same. Because right. now he's stepping into the public, and he's mm-hmm. beginning his public ministry. And so as he's saying this, like I said, it's voiceover narration. And we see that they have finished filling the jars with water, and Jesus asks everyone to step outside. Mm-hmm. And Jesus, he stands in there by himself, and he says, I am ready, Father. He reaches into the water, which, once again, it's not filled to the brim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he reaches into the water, and his hand comes out, and it's dripping wine. Yes. And then he tells them to draw some out and deliver it to the master of the banquet, and Jesus smiles at Thomas. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of this whole scene? It's a really common story that everyone knows from mm-hmm. the Bible, from Scripture. So I feel like it can be hard to make it come out, like, in the form of, like, a, a movie format, just because everyone knows it, and it's mm-hmm. so common, it's going to be really easy to critique. and be mm-hmm. like, no, I think it's this way. No, I think it's that yeah. way. You could have done this to do it better. But I think that they did a really mm-hmm. good, good job at portraying that. Yeah. And being really accurate to scripture. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things where it's hard, because just like you were saying, it's mm-hmm. easy to critique it. Yeah. And I think this is where it's hard for me as, like, the Bible nerd. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me because all the other stuff, and because I think so far the show has, to me, been, like, almost perfection. Mm-hmm. 
when I get to the scene, I'm like, ugh. Like, I love, visually, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I could see why they did it from a filmmaking perspective. Mm-hmm. But there's certain things where, like, it's just weird to me. Like, the fact that they didn't fill it to the brim. If the water is to the brim, he couldn't have added anything into it to make it look like wine. Yeah. Right? Because it was filled to the brim. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that, that was, to me, like, a significant thing. But it also wouldn't have been as, like, like it wouldn't have been an issue. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, he also put, like, told them to leave the room. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, if you're not going to have them fill it to the brim, at least leave them in the room so they can see that he right. didn't do anything to it. Right. But instead, it wasn't filled to the brim, and they had him leave the room. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, so now Jesus has been in there alone with it. So some people could very well be like, oh, he must have added something in there to make yeah. it look like wine. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, from a filmmaking perspective, like I said, I get it. Mm-hmm. But from, like, being a Bible nerd, I'm like, ah, man, so close. Like, I just... Mm-hmm. Everything else has been so good. And even that, like, you know, if you watch, like, our episode four breakdown, you'll see I'm fine with them changing certain things. Like, they didn't go out into the deep water for Peter to catch the fish. I don't think that's as significant. But there's certain things, like Jesus saying woman to Mary, I feel like that's a, there's a specific point to that in the right. Gospel of John. Them filling it to the brim, I feel like that's also important. Mm-hmm. And so if you weren't going to have them fill it to the brim, I would have much preferred them, like, stay in there so they could just see he didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. It was literally him just standing there. But... I, I will say, to its credit, mm-hmm. I liked them having say, him saying, like, I'm ready, Father. Mm-hmm. I'm ready, Father. Because Jesus realizes there's this no turning start. back. Yeah. Yeah, like, he's been here. Like, he came to earth for this purpose, mm-hmm. and this is what starts the whole journey. Yeah. Right? It's like, okay, at this point, his disciples are going to believe in him, mm-hmm. and they're going to go forward, and it, things are going to be different now. Mm-hmm. So, I, I did really like that a whole lot. Also, you have to remember, this story comes from the Gospel of John. Yeah. And of all the Gospels, the Gospel of John is my absolute favorite. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, it's like it's like my little like my little child. I'm uh-huh. like, don't mess with it. I like it so much. Uh-huh. Uh, but overall, it's still, it's a beautiful scene. Breathtakingly beautiful scene. Mm-hmm. I, I do really like it. There's just little details. I'm like, ah, oh, just change it a little bit and I would, it'd be perfect. So my bad, guys. This is future David coming in to correct past David's error. I mentioned that I was going to read the passage that this whole... Uh, episode is based off of and I just forgot to read it Uh, so for those of you who actually made it this far into the video I was just going to read that very quickly and I'll edit this at some point into the video it might be at the very end it might be interspersed I don't know but there it is so this passage uh, this whole episode is based off of John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 and it reads this on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Right, so that's basically the passage that this entire episode revolves around. And it seems like John's main point in presenting this is first off to demonstrate what Jesus' first sign was. So his first miracle he ever performed, which, like we mentioned, uh, is slightly different than how they portray it in The Chosen. But that's just because they've just shuffled around the chronology a little bit, which isn't a big deal. But then it's also to show a shift in the relationship between Jesus and his mother, or really his family at large, right? Since he's stepping into his public ministry... Now he's no longer relating to people how he did prior. Now he's relating to people as the king who has arrived, as the rabbi to the student, as the lord to the slave or servant, right? So no longer is he the son or the brother or the child or just the friend. Now he is the king, right? So that's why he calls his mother woman. Uh, But then also we see that he has power over creation. He can turn water to wine, which shows that he is God, which is also really cool. Uh, we also see his mother's faith in there. Uh, we see the Jewish rites of purification and all that stuff like with the jars. We see that they're filled to the brim to show he didn't add anything in there, but he just turned water to wine. And we kind of have this callback to Moses, right? To where Moses, he turned water to blood. Jesus turned water to wine. So he's kind of being like Moses, but even greater. Uh, but then we also have the whole thing where 
the master of the ceremony comes out and he says, hey, everyone serves the good wine first and they serve the bad wine wine for later, but you have chosen to serve the best wine now, far later, right? And so that's actually really cool uh, because that's exactly what Jesus did. And there's also a really hopeful message in there for us. But it also seems to be that the reason why John presented this is to show us that this is what made the disciples officially believe in Jesus. It wasn't this super public sign, but it was the first public sign where a few people heard about it, right? The servants heard about it, and then the disciples believed in him. And I think that might be why they included Thomas as one of the servants, because one of the servants becomes a disciple, right? So, kind of cool stuff, but that's the passage this is all about, and it says that Jesus manifested his glory here Um, which, once again, really cool stuff. But that being said, that is the passage. That's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to sneak in here real quick, share that with you, because that's the whole point of these videos. We want to show you what's from Scripture, and so whenever an event from Scripture takes place, we want to read that passage. That being said, I'm going to hand it back off to my past self and Brienne so they can finish up the talk about this episode. So, bye! Um, But then... Oh, we get to the final part where, you know, the master of the banquet, he stops everything to announce how great the wine is. For a second, you're like, oh, no, he's about to shame everybody. He's like, yeah, people usually bring the worst wine out later. And people are like, oh, they're about to like, he's about to shame us for it publicly. But he's like, but this wine's amazing. And they're like, yay, cool. Uh, And so they have a toast. And everyone drinks, you know, blessed be you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit of the vine, especially this wine, because this stuff is the best. You mm-hmm. save the best for last. Really cool. Uh, and then Higla asks Abner if something is wrong. And he says, yes, I was. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, and then Mary and Jesus, uh, Mary, his mother, they exchange a knowing glance, which is, it's a pretty sweet glance, you know. Yeah. She's like looking around for him and then she finds him and he just looks and he's like, she, he's like, yeah, you know who did that. Uh-huh. That was me. That uh-huh. was me, mom. <laughs> Uh, Because you have to remember also, Mary wasn't necessarily expecting Jesus to perform a miracle because, this this is another thing why sometimes chronology does matter here, because if Jesus was already performing a bunch of miracles, it would make sense that Mary's like, hey, they're out of wine, go do something. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whenever you're in John chapter 2, it doesn't seem like she was expecting that. Right. She was just like, hey, Jesus, you're the man of the house, I need you to do something. And Mm -hmm. he's like, I'm not the man of the house anymore. Mm -hmm. I have my own mission. I'm going to do, I'm like, I am the king going about establishing the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer the man of the house. You know, so that, that's why the chronology, it does affect things a little bit. But I don't think she was expecting a miracle, but he did provide it, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Uh, and so they exchange a knowing glance. And then it cuts to Thomas. He's just looking at the jars and he's like, <laughs> he's like super confused. Um, and then Simon walks up to Jesus and he says, fish, wine, what will be next? And Jesus says, any suggestions? Uh-huh. <laughs> and then Simon, this is, once again, we see him going to the extremes. He's like, he just immediately gets pumped up. He's like, anything and everything. Let's do this. I'll go, to, I'll go with you to the ends of the earth. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah. Like, that's the Simon Peter I know. I love Simon's character. Yeah, it, it's, it's really so funny. Uh, but then, this was like a misdirect, right? Because he's like, I'll go to the ends of the earth with you. And then Jesus kind of gets like, kind of like, like stoic and like serious. And he mm-hmm. says, I hope so, Simon. But I remember that there's still a problem. And to me, I was like, they're not going to have him, like, predict the betrayal. I mean, like, the denials now, right? I was like, yeah. that's like three and a half years away. Yeah, that's yeah. where I thought they were heading with it. Because so exactly. whenever you go to the Last Supper, Peter's like, I'll go to the end of the world with you. And Jesus is like, no, you're going to deny me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they're going to, like, do that now, too? Yeah. But instead, he's like, I noticed there's a problem. And Simon's like, what? Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, I think it's something about two left feet. Yeah. <laughs> he's talking about Andrew with the dancing and stuff like yeah. that. And Simon's like, oh, yeah, let's go dance. And so Jesus, he joins in with the dancing and stuff. Yeah. Um, and they're all dancing around, and he convinces Andrew to start, you know, dancing too. Uh-huh. Uh, and Simon's like, so will you help him? And Jesus says, huh, there's some things even I can't do. <laughs> and I can guarantee you right now, uh-huh. I am sure there are people who had a problem with that line. Really? I, I, yeah. I mean, this is God in the flesh. You know, this is Jesus Christ saying there's some things I can't do. Mm-hmm. But you got to realize Jesus had a sense of humor. I could totally imagine Jesus saying this, and it's a joke, right? Oh, so yeah. don't take yourself so seriously. Yes, Jesus can do everything. Yes, God is all-powerful. God can do everything that he wishes and that he desires to do. Yeah. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here. Mm-hmm. Jesus is making a joke. And if you get offended by this joke, I think there might be, like, this is just serious counsel. I think there might be a pride issue there. Because I think that you might be taking things a little bit too seriously. And when I say things, I think you might be taking yourself a little too seriously. Mm -hmm. 
I think Jesus is fine with making jokes, mainly because when you look in Scripture, he definitely does make jokes. Yeah. And there's definitely things. Whenever you read Scripture, you have to realize that all Scripture is God-breathed, and there are definitely humorous moments in Scripture. I'm not saying he would say it, but I'm saying it is a possibility. Yeah. Right? It's a slight joke, and if you get offended by that joke, just calm down. Go take a chill pill and... uh probably just watch a different show honestly I, yeah. I, I really don't know what to say because especially because this show is really into giving him human like qualities yes. so it's really interweaved and in throughout all of the episodes yes slow down and observe the whole show mm. together and ask yourself is this show giving reverence to god and is it consistent with scripture that's the main thing you need to ask because I think sometimes we see one thing we don't like and we immediately villainize something and we're like, oh, I don't like that. Like Jesus made a joke about not being able to do everything. This show's terrible. No, slow down. Look at the rest of it. Even if, like, let's just say hypothetically, this was not a proper joke to make. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically. Say it wasn't. Look at the rest of it. Does it seem like the writers had malicious intent in writing it? Mm -hmm. No. I don't think so, because I think in other places we see clearly they are wanting to give reverence to Jesus, and they demonstrate that he is God in the flesh. He says certain things that make it very clear he is God, mm. right? Earlier in this episode, he literally was like, get used to that, Thomas. So yeah. he implies he knows who Thomas is. Right. He just performed a miracle. He turned water to wine. Go read the Old Testament and tell me where you mm. see water being turned into wine, and tell me who's the one doing that type of stuff. Is it God or is it man? I think it's God. Yeah. I think it's a really funny way to end the episode because yeah. then, then literally that we, we cut from that scene and it's Thomas standing there with Rama and he's just saying like, I don't even know what just happened, but I do know that Jesus has asked us to go join him and his disciples in Samaria in 12 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and that lets you know the next three episodes are going to take place over the course of those 12 days because... We're not going to see them again until season two. Mm -hmm. And spoiler alert, season one ends in Samaria. <sighs> so it's building up. But uh, so Thomas says, you know, I, I just don't know what to think. And mm -hmm. so Rama says, so don't. Maybe for once in your life, don't think. Mm -hmm. And it cuts to black. And then it says, That's the really chosen. Bad. And we have reached the end of episode five. Yes. I know I talked a long time, but there was so much to talk about. I had to do it. But Can now that we have finally reached the end, will you tell me what you thought about this episode overall? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really good. I don't know if it was my favorite. I've been trying to like wrestle through and think about if it was my like rank it because I know we rank each of them. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think of all the episodes combined. I don't think it was my favorite, but I did like it a lot. I think it was, still was a good episode, mm -hmm. but I, I've liked all of them. So mm -hmm. it's like, huh. <laughs> yeah. So that being said, yeah. what would you rank it? Scale of one to five. That's one what we've been five. doing. Right, every episode, stuff. every time I've had somebody here, we've been ranking these episodes. Mm -hmm. I don't remember all of your rankings, but right here, I'll put it right here. I will put all the rankings yeah. that she has given them. Uh -huh. What would you rank episode five of The Chosen? I think I would give it four stars. Four stars? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Okay, four stars out of five. Do you remember what you ranked the last one? You weren't in episode four. Uh, uh, no. Okay. I think, wasn't, that was Jonathan. Yeah, that was Jonathan. Yeah, so I was in the one before. In episode three, you gave a five. Five. Right? Yes, I think you've I given episode episode one, two, three, it was three, four, five, yes, right? Yes, it was three, four, four five. Three, four, five, and then now you give that one a four. Yeah. What, do you, what do you rate episode four? Which one was episode four? You know what? <laughs> it'll be fine it'll be fine okay well i'll ask you that later once we'll talk about it and i'll just put your score okay. in there as well uh okay so this episode you give it a four out of five yeah i'm gonna give it a three out of five um but once again i want to clarify that when i'm ranking these episodes i'm ranking them in view of the entire season as a whole mm -hmm. and i want you to know that i think every single episode is amazing mm -hmm. And so, basically, all these episodes, like, even if I gave it a one, I'm not saying it's a bad episode. Mm -hmm. It just means it wasn't my favorite. Uh, and this one, I actually really liked it from, like, a production value. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah, like, from production value, I'm like, wow, this is actually, it's probably one of the most beautiful episodes so far. I, I think they probably, it seems like they had an increased budget for episode five mm -hmm. through eight because it seems like the production value went up even more and it was already good enough in episodes one through four. Yeah. But this is a very beautiful episode. But just the, the few things where I'm just, like, a stickler. When it comes to j just a few things where I'm like, ah, yeah. like, I just love whenever scripture is adapted. And I will say, of all the times I've seen this story adapted, mm -hmm. this is the best one. 100%. Yeah. It's the best I've seen. And that seems to be consistently the case with all the things. Mm -hmm. But just for the few things where I'm like, ah, I wish that he'd said woman, uh, whereas he goes out of his way to say mother, which means they made a conscious choice to do that. Or I'm like, that seems to contradict what the Bible's going for there. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to see that shift because I think that would e that's even 
that would have been a very important thing to see for Jesus. Mm -hmm. You could see the characterization there where it's like, you see him having to kind of turn his priorities. Mm -hmm. And that would have been an interesting thing to explore in the character of Jesus. You know, that that would have been interesting. Um, So I wish that they'd done that. Uh, And then, really, the filling it to the brim thing wasn't that important to me. But whenever you couple it together, I was like, ah, just... There's a few things I would have tweaked there. And so it just bumps it down just a little bit for me. Yeah. Um, But once again, I'm not saying it's a bad episode. I like every single episode in this show. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying it's not my favorite and it doesn't meet, like, the levels of, like, episode four. Right. Um, Even though I will say, I think this episode might be a more rewatchable episode for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, like, if I were to just, like, play an episode, I think I would like to just rewatch this one more. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to just adapting scripture and stuff, that's probably the most important. Like, that's really going to affect my rankings the most. Right. In these things. Like, just as a clarification, if you want to know why I'm ranking things higher, it's usually because they adapted scripture really well and I really liked it. Yeah. And if it's a little lower, it's just because there's a few differences that I had. Mm. So you give it a four out of five. I'll give it a three out of five. Do you have any other comments to make about this thing? I don't think so. Okay, cool. I'm sorry for talking so long. <laughs> I know you're probably just sitting over here. I just get a lot to say. And uh, yeah, so there is the chosen episode five. If you mm-hmm. sat through this whole thing, Very I'm not efficient. even gonna. Yeah, I'm not even gonna ask you to subscribe. If you sat through it, you probably are subscribed. Honestly. But um. Just thank you, honestly. If you made this entire thing, wow. Like, round of applause. Thank you so much. You are a trooper. I'll try to edit this down to make it a little bit shorter, but I just want you to know, like, this, just the rough cut. Yeah. We're at exactly two hours right now. Yeah. And so I'll try to, I'll try to break it down so it's not as long for you, but no promises. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, uh, I have nothing else to say. You have nothing else to say. Yep. So all we will say is, I am David. And I'm Brienne. And this has been Now Let's Be Honest About Movies. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.